Right, so yeah, kia, kia ora everybody and welcome to um, the NZRSB conference and AGM for 2022. Um, look, great to have you guys in the room um, and also welcome to people online as well. Um, in our COVID world, it's just awesome to actually be in a room in person talking to you guys, so um, that's really great. Um, just before I get going, just some health, health and safety. Um, obviously, if there's an earthquake, we're going we're gonna to drop, um, cover and hold, and then wait to, to be escorted out of, out of the building. Um, obviously, there's a couple of exits, and um, the meeting point is actually in the car park around out and over to the, to the right. Um, toilets are just back down the, the hallway, back down near the restaurant, so that gets out of the way. Um, look, just really want to, mine's really brief, we're already behind time, so Louise is already cracking the whip and I'm getting growled at. So um, just really wanted to, uh, just a quick sort of intro to NZRSB around um, what we want to get out of today. Um, and I think the big thing is, is collaboration, um, value everyone's input in the room across our, our, our value chain. I think that's really important. It's a real open, it's an open forum, so there's, you know, we'd want everyone to express their, their opinions, but... But yeah, no, no, no agendas or anything like that. We're all here to try and collaborate and, and work together. But um, as NZRSB, we really do value your feedback um, and your opinions um, across our value chain. Um, so just, uh, just a couple of introductions. Um, Rhiannon, <laughs> Rhiannon James. Um, in the corner here is going to be our visual scribe for the day. So that's something completely different for me. Um, but yeah, she's going to be a visual scribe today and, and record um, the day and, 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 the, um, and the talking, and etc. Um, so yeah, just going to introduce, we do have uh, Craig Wiggins here today and he's going to be our facilitator for the first, um, or most of the day. Um, so, you know, Craig is a rural commentator and advocate. Um, he's the founder of um, Whatever with Wiggy, support network for farmers. Um, he's a mental and physical health facilitator. And in 2021, he was the Ravenstown Agriculture Commentator or communicator of the year. So real privilege to have Craig with us today. So yeah, I'll let him take over and um, talk to you guys later on. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great uh, privilege to be here as your facilitator and uh, timekeeper basically today. And because we're already two minutes behind, Richard, <laughs> you've set me up. It's good to see a few friendly faces that I've, I've had for years here. Yes, yeah, Sarah. Um, so it's great to, and I, I'm just amazed at, um, at how much power and how much presence a group like this can have and, and can lead the pathway into sustainable beef. So um, good luck with that, and uh, let's see if we can uh, make sure that this conference works well today for that. Uh, without further ado, I think our first speaker should uh, be up here, and I'm not going to um, deduct two minutes off his time because he's got a lot of information and experience. Would you please welcome from the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, the Executive Director, Rory Peter. Well, thank you for inviting me here. Where do I point this thing? Anyone? There? Okay. Why does this always happen? Oh, sort of. Is that me doing that now, or are you? Okay, good. Sorry about that. Right, so I just want to quickly introduce the Global Roundtable. I think most of you know us, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these slides. Um, since our foundation in 2012 as an official organization, we've expanded the number of national initiatives to cover 24 countries. We've now also got a um, member in South Korea who are very keen to establish a national roundtable in South Korea as well and interest from a couple of other Asian countries. I'll come back to that in, in a minute. The China one is a different color there because it's been very difficult to keep contact with them over the last couple of years. Uh, I understand that it's still active, but um, not really very closely involved with GRSB at the moment. We'll try and remedy that. Um, there we go. We've got loads of... Uh, now over 100 members in six constituencies, so producers are really central to what we do, processors with those big names like uh, Cargill, Tyson, uh, JBS, Minerva, and Marfrig, etc. We, we cover a significant proportion of the global beef trade. 
we have a lot of those allied industries uh, like the input providers, um, the pharmaceutical companies, banks, etc. A few retailers were probably our weakest constituency in some respects, but the ones we do have are significant, at, um, like restaurant brands, International McDonald's, uh, and our hold being quite a big global um, supermarket chain. And then the round tables at the moment, we've got um, 12 of them, and that could still expand more. Civil society, that's NGOs, basically, and academia, uh, and then uh, a few consulting members. Those are usually either government um, or UN or other organizations that um, they're not allowed to have a voting role in GRSB, but we do want their advice and their input. And the, uh, the observers are just people who are sitting on the fence, not quite ready to join yet, but um, watching to see if that's something they want to be part of. So important thing that happened last year, and most of you know this already, is that we set three global goals. Um, and these are in no particular order, but animal health and welfare, uh, climate, and nature positive production. These were the three areas that we saw as being the most important globally, where we're facing challenges where the global public uh, and policymakers are really scrutinizing what the beef industry does. So there were the areas where we thought it was a priority to have these goals. They're all for 2030. Um, so animal health and welfare, we go into more detail about how you would actually do that and, and how you would measure it. But what we're talking about is making sure that we're providing the cattle with a life worth living. Um, we're essentially working on reducing mortality simply because that's something that we can measure. Uh, more easily than an animal-based um, welfare measure, and that we're providing training in the right places uh, to the right standard. Climate, it's a fairly straightforward figure, reduce the intensity of emissions per kilo of beef by 30% by 2030 on a pathway to neutrality. We didn't set a date for neutrality because there are large parts of the world where we really don't have an insight into how we would reach that yet. Um, and particularly, if we don't meet our nature positive goal, we wouldn't be able to, to meet that climate goal either. So nature positive, we talk about um, that in those terms. Clearly, the main priority in the beginning is uh, stopping deforestation, uh, largely in Latin America, but also making sure that we're sequestering carbon in grasslands, that we're preserving uh, the biodiversity in grasslands, etc. So again, that's a, a 2030 goal. So, in order to meet these goals, we have undertaken a number of activities. The Beef Carbon Footprint Guideline was uh, released er earlier this year, uh, just to bring those countries that didn't yet have an LCA for their beef industry, uh, to provide them with a, with a tool that would enable them to do that and give us sort of consistency of reporting across our um, national initiatives. Um, we are working with Emerging Ag to support our representation at uh, COP27. We see that as being a very important part of the communications of the beef industry to be at those uh, type of events and telling the world what we're already doing and the level of our ambitions to uh, become uh, climate neutral. And Sure Harvest is uh, part of the Where Food Comes From uh, overall company. They are helping us with the monitoring and verification system so that we can start reporting across the globe. Now, it's going to be really hard, obviously, to get consistent data from different countries. So that's why we had to employ uh, Sure Harvest to help us with that. And then Roan Marketing is a company who's really working on communications just to help us. We have an agency in London. Roan Marketing is more working directly with our team so that we have... Uh, you know, updated social media, etc. Right, I just wanted to show you an example of what some other um, roundtables are doing. Well, the US roundtable has set these high priority indicators which align very well with our goals. They've set them uh, across a wider range of uh, things than, than our goals include, and they've set them for each part of the value chain so that you'll have a producer. A set of targets, you'll have processor targets, you'll have retail targets. Um, so this thing is really inconsistent how it works. There we go. They're achieving climate neutrality by 2040, which I think you'll agree is pretty ambitious. Um, 
they're establishing these uh, grazing management plans across 385 million acres by 2050. Again, pretty sizable task. Um, water is probably a much bigger issue. I mean, it's a big issue everywhere, but in the U.S., especially the western half of the U.S., uh, where they're really running out of water. The Ogallala Aquifer is drying up. There's parts of it that will be dry probably in five years if they don't significantly change the way they manage it. And several rivers there, the same, the Colorado River. Um, again, on animal welfare, training is really the, the, the focus on uh, these two, actually. There's both uh, the, the people in the community part and the animal health and welfare. Uh, so ensuring that everybody is trained uh, properly to avoid accidents and then to come in line with BQA in terms of animal welfare. That's their benchmark. And then in terms of efficiency and yield, really they wanted to, to reduce waste to zero for, to landfill from, from their operations at Packers and so on. So that's just an idea. I wanted to show you that example because the U.S. has got a fairly comprehensive framework and it, it's a good example for you to see for, for New Zealand. Right, well, obviously you're all working in the same direction. I just put that up there to say, well, we, we see that as being well aligned with us, but obviously we're looking forward to the next step to see what the, the concrete steps and how you're gonna be able to report into GRSB is gonna work. Um, I wanted to talk about communications because as I said earlier on, it's really an important part of what we all do. Um, you know. Part of the reason for the roundtables was, was the very negative publicity. And obviously there are problems and we, we have to acknowledge all of the problems that do exist in the beef industry. But we also need to communicate the positive things that are going on. Oh, yeah? Oh, you can just, just let me know. Okay, well, if you, next one, please. Right, there we go. And we think it's important to communicate with policymakers um, because they will, hear a large amount of uh, communication from people who are essentially opposed to the beef industry for whatever reason, and there are lots of voices, uh, opposing voices. We need to talk positively about the progress we have made and the progress we are uh, aiming to make in the coming years. Um, so we, we know that we can deliver on SDGs, we know that we can deliver on climate and uh, on nutrition and on welfare and other aspects. But that message needs to be as loud and as clear as, as the messages that are coming from our opponents. Um, we need to really get investors on board with actually contributing to this and making sure they're enabling uh, the whole value chain to, to deliver. Uh, they need to actually get behind this and say, well, w we only want to invest in projects which are sustainable and uh, which actually improve the way the industry works rather than just business as usual. Obviously our members, we need to communicate constantly with what we are doing and, and, and communicate beyond uh, the round table with what they are doing. Uh, we need to bring in members. And although we don't communicate directly with consumers, our national round tables on the whole do. Um, and so we need to be able to provide consistent messaging to our national round tables that they can then adapt to their own um, specific context and communicate with uh, um, consumers in their own country. Canada's a good example. They do a great job of com communicating directly with the consumer there, and some good examples. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, we have a monthly webinar. I think many of you have uh, either participated or, or at least listened into those webinars. Probably not the last one, because it was at 3 o'clock for New Zealand, 3 o'clock in the morning, but uh, generally uh, pretty well received. We did a series of webinars as well with AICA, the Inter-American Agency for Cooperation on Agriculture, uh, and the Canadian Roundtable. That was a good one. It went out to a more general audience. Our normal webinars are just for GRSB members, but that one was for, for a wider public. It was quite well received and well attended. We, have, we had uh, around about 200 people listening into that for each of them. Okay, next. Uh, we have a summit, a communicator summit. We've done this a few times already. We, the last one was in 2019 in Chicago. This year, uh, it's going to be in Denver in November, the day before our conference. And essentially what we do is we're going to revisit a global survey of consumer uh, trends. 
Uh, Pollinate in Australia helped us with that last time. They're doing the same research this time and I'm going to present back on that. One of the things that Howard Parry Husbands, who does this research, has, has observed, and he hasn't yet done the meta-analysis, but what he's saying is he's seen um, consumers start to turn a little bit against being told all the time what they must do, but they're, they're looking for information about the things that interest and concern them. So rather than just listening to, say, uh, government or NGOs or pressure groups, they're looking for the information that supports the choice they want to make already. So they're keen to eat beef, and still the majority of consumers are keen to eat beef, but they are definitely looking for reasons why that's a good choice, and we need to be able to provide those reasons. Next, thanks. Um, and we're also um, trying to keep a, a steady flow of articles up uh, through the press, not just the industry press. I mean, it's easiest for us to get traction in the industry press, but we're also trying to get to a more mainstream press to tell stories and positive stories about progress being made. So we had um, one from a member in Argentina and Uruguay. They own a lot of ranches there. They had ISO... Um, they had an ISO audit on all of their ranches to establish what the, the carbon balance was in terms of sequestration and uh, tree cover and emissions. And they found that over their ranches, with the exception of one where they had a massive fire, they were, they were sequestering considerably more uh, carbon than they were emitting. And, you know, that was sort of big news to them, but it's also big news around the world. We've seen from Australia... Um, a recent story where they were sequestering 50 kilos per uh, kilo uh, of emissions. Uh, no, sorry, per kilo of beef, wasn't it? Uh, which, you know, okay, it's an exception, um, but it's still a very positive story which tells you what is possible. Uh, we're not suggesting that everybody can do that, but we're suggesting that for sure there's a lot of room for um, a positive emission story. Okay, next, thanks. Uh, so the next, uh, and next... Uh, is the Global Conference on Sustainable Beef. You're all, of course, welcome to attend uh, in Denver, November 7th till the 10th, that first day being the Communicators Summit. Two days of conference and then a day of uh, beef industry tours in uh, the, the northern part of uh, Colorado. Uh, we'll really look forward to having you there. Obviously, some of you will come there, hopefully, to talk about what uh, the New Zealand Roundtable is doing and share the positive information about the, the Roundtable and what's happening here in New Zealand. And I think that's all my slides, isn't it? Yep, there you go. So that's how you can contact me. Uh, obviously, follow GRSB on any of those social media channels uh, to bump up Kelly's performance. She's always delighted every month to tell us how, how well they're doing. So that's all I had. Thank you very much, Roy. Um, does anyone have any questions for Rory? Uh, we've got a few minutes, probably five. So, um, well, I have one. Rory, how are you getting on with the mainstream media, getting these messages out when there's a lot of narrative around mainstream media in the other direction? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we had had very, very little exposure in the mainstream media until two years ago. And it's only through building up these case studies and an interesting story where you've got some human interest, some environmental interest. Then the mainstream in, um, media is not particularly interested in, in a one-issue story that comes from industry, but when you can build it into more of a, a generalized story with positive aspects touching a few of, of the areas that we're working in, they have shown a little bit more interest, but they'll often then go and look for some opposing views as well. So the stories are never exactly what we want, but on the other hand, at least we're getting out there and people are hearing about what we're all doing. Very good. And country by country, bringing it all together, um, how's that progress going? So, I mean, this, this year with uh, Sure Harvest working on a reporting framework, that is going to be a test of how some of the roundtables are working. You know, there are all at different levels. And, and even though New Zealand was formed more recently than some of the others, you had a lot of material already to work with. Whereas some of the countries, let's say in Latin America, they've had a round table in Mexico for you know, a little bit longer, but they didn't have the starting framework, they didn't have the farm assurance programs and so on. So it's really hard for them to get traction. Um, 
it, it's going to be a test. Certainly reporting is going to be very testing. What are the biggest challenges you've faced so far and what have you been able to fix and what haven't you been able to fix or is work in progress? Um, to, I think, if I'm frank, the biggest, the biggest challenge I think we face is getting some of those Latin American countries to acknowledge that deforestation is an issue that they need to be addressing. Um, it's, it's really difficult because the, the international perspective is, of course, that needs to stop. But the, their home country perspective is, you know, this is our land, our forest, and a lot of it is privately owned. Um, it's our prerogative to do with that what we are allowed to do with our own national legal framework. And all of their legal frameworks do allow for some deforestation. So that's why we frame this as a nature positive goal rather than a deforestation goal. Because if we had just simply put a deforestation goal there, we would have probably lost the buy-in from, from Latin America. They, they always say, okay, if we're going to do this, what are you all going to do? So that, you know, it's finding a balance there. That, that's a huge challenge. Is that around education? Um, uh, on the benefits of what's achievable? Yeah, and it, I mean, the benefit, talking about the benefits of what's achievable, there are systems, you know, silvopastoral systems. There are good examples in Latin America, in countries like uh, Colombia, Paraguay, etc., which are far more productive than a purely pasture-based system. And they have multiple benefits uh, to the environment. They're very expensive, though. And if we can't get investors to say, yeah, that's what we need to be supporting, it, the average producer can't afford to, to, to make that transition. So it's a combination of finance, education, you know, the level of interest of people to actually make it happen. Just um, anybody got anything else? Okay. Yeah, the, the weak point around members in the retail space got any plans of expanding that? How would you do it? Um, I th it's kind of happening at the moment. We're, we're getting increased interest from retailers because of their reporting requirements, especially around uh, scope three emissions. So uh, that is the, the main sort of discussion point with them. I mean, Woolworths actually wasn't on there. Woolworths has joined since then. And we've had uh, discussions with Coles. So hopefully Coles will join. I've had discussions with uh, a retail group in Hong Kong that covers several Asian countries. They're interested in joining. And it's all driven by scope three emissions. I guess the last one for me is around communication for Joe Public. Everybody thinks and talks a little bit different. How do you get your message across so many different um, genres of, of public awareness? Yeah, so as I said, we, GRSB doesn't try to talk to global consumers. It would be ridiculous. Uh, so we let the national groups do that. You've all got your own context and, and for sure the understanding of the, the New Zealand public about beef sustainability is completely different from what would be the case in Argentina, for example. So we really leave that to uh, the national groups. Good as gone. Hey, thanks, Rory. Any last questions before Rory goes? Two minutes. Rory, you made up time. You saved some time. Yeah, good man. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to move now to the Director of Beef Sustainability and the GRSB President, Ian McConnell. Welcome, Ian. Please put your hands together. Thank you. I, I might just quickly offer one extra answer to that question around retailers and one of the challenges we face at GRSB is the fact that because we have national roundtables we see a lot of members especially who have national footprints rather than international footprints being represented at local roundtables so if you look at Canada and the US you've got companies like Walmart and others active there so in the roundtable family it's probably a lot more retail membership than than just the GRSB membership looks so like that. I'll quickly introduce myself and then, then get into my slides. Uh, I uh, grew up on a cattle farm in uh, Queensland, Australia, uh, sixth generation there. And then I've weirdly spent the last 10 years, up until two years ago, working with the World Wildlife Fund after a decade as a beef and sheep extension officer. And I spent 10 years uh, as their global lead for livestock, helping WWF do things like set up national roundtables all around the world, uh, work with 
corporates to write sustainability strategies and help advocate in that space. And then two years ago, um, you know, it's slightly blessing in disguise, got called in to Tyson to help actually deliver some of those things that we'd um, helped advocate for. So now I'm, I'm being held accountable for 10 years of advocacy, which is, uh, I'm, I'm learning the challenges that come with that. Uh, if I go to the next slide, or does, does this start working? Oh. Perfect. The, um, and who are Tyson? Tyson, uh, not relatively well known in this part of the world. Uh, the world's second largest protein company behind JBS. Uh, very big in chicken, mostly. Our footprint in this part of the world is a further processing plant in Australia where uh, we work very closely, use a little bit of New Zealand beef over there as well, but uh, McDonald's are our predominant customer out of Australia. But then also in uh, the international space where I work as Director of Sustainability for everything outside the US. Um, as you can see, there's 140 countries, so there's 139 of those outside the US that sort of fall under my remit for sustainability. In terms of footprint, these are the numbers that most farmers try to understand, 155,000 cattle a week. The 45 million chicken number always amazes me how that actually works logistically. Uh, but we, a little bit of pork, and then we're starting and really growing this prepared food space. So how do we prepare foods for a modern consumer and how do we innovate the way we provide protein to consumers all around the world? And we have this thing called the formula to feed the future, um, which for us is about trying to work out how we as a company deliver sustainable food, but also how we as a company are trusted and enabled by consumers to do that. And we hope they're the same thing, um, but there's a risk they may not be. There's a risk that we can do whatever we try to reduce our footprint, reduce our waste, and be net positive but there's still a narrative outside that that says animals shouldn't be in the food system. So we need to make sure that the messaging and the actions are actually aligning with the community values the whole way through. So there's a, there's a degree of science and there's a degree of sort of personal understanding of consumers that come into writing these strategies. And the continual updating of our materiality assessment, that is what is important to the consumer, uh, is really important because the consumer's evolving. You know, Roy touched on the, the updated work that Pollinate are doing for the GRSB, and we're going to learn more and more as we go through that journey over the next subsequent years because we're seeing a change. Millennials are now the largest consumer, uh, largest purchasing consumer segment. They've now got young families, so they're now making decisions based on thoughts of others rather than just themselves. So there's this change happening and we need to be aware of what that might look like. And I'll give, I'll give you an insight that, that we have had um, in the US through our consumer research is sort of three, four years ago, people wanted to know around nature, sustainability, and, and that was gonna work for them. Now it's far more concrete. Uh, when we asked them last year, they wanna know what's the GHG footprint? Is it lower? Is it better? They, they know what the issues are and they want to see it actually addressed clearly rather than these more nebulous claims. And I'll get back to why I think that's important for groups like Roundtable soon. I've got, I've got a couple of really busy slides and I'm not gonna ask you to read them, but um, the next three slides just sort of show to you the amount of data we're trying to communicate uh, through our sustainability reports. So we, we have a whole range of numbers around our people and communities, around our product responsibility, around our um, natural capital and natural resources targets. The real challenge with those now is the biggest piece of all those numbers comes in what we call, in climate terms, is called scope three, but in the other footprints is just the impact that comes to us from our um, suppliers. And we're going to have to start finding ways to report those, those numbers really credibly. At the moment, we're talking a lot about uh, announcements, uh, developing things. And we haven't yet begun to move the needle on a number of these topics. That's partly because of the challenge in doing so, but partly also because of the level of buy-in we're going to need at an industry level. Um, 
It's, and it's not unique to a company of our scale. Um, there are lots of um, your customers and the consumer that buy a little bit of every cow. They don't buy specific lines. Or, if you're looking at a policy or a more um, social license point of view, it is the impact of every cow, of every farm that clouds that judgment. So it is that industry scale um, and that collaboration across supply chains that's gonna help drive the change. As a company, we'll continue to try and grow our slice of the pie, but we also need the pie to get bigger. And that's where this collaboration becomes really important. The risk of not doing that, or the risk of doing it the wrong way, is that if we're setting up on-farm systems, et cetera, for one purpose that doesn't meet another. And I'll, I'll give you an example. There's, there's a, there was a program in Queensland, Australia called the Grazing BMP, a, a really fantastic program that was set up to help measure and identify what was happening on grazing farms in Queensland. It was really deliberately set up initially to help stave off um, some regulations from the government. But they hoped it would also deliver an economic return to farmers. But because it was never set up to align to the reporting frameworks, the measurement frameworks that we as customers have to report to, there, weren't, there wasn't data or information in that system that added value to the customer that we could then invest back in the, or could pay the farmer for. So when, you, when you're investing systems and it's you know, the farm assurance schemes, et cetera, one of the great lenses and filters to run over those systems is are they helping your customers um, pass value down the supply chain? Are they meeting the Global Reporting Alliance, the Global Reporting Initiative, the Carbon Disclosure Project type frameworks, the science-based target initiative guidelines? If they are, then people will have to, at some point heading towards 2030, start preferentially sourcing New Zealand beef because it'll be one of the few beef products that's actually moving that needle for them. We've learnt that we have to partner with a lot of people to achieve these targets, um, especially the farmers and ranchers bit. You know, I, was, I actually finally got to go to Arkansas and meet the, my, my bosses who I've just been meeting on Zoom for a long time, work out who's tall and who's short and uh, all those things, actually what colour people, pants people wear. But the, we've really started to, and I think some of the finance industries you know, have done this as well, is start thinking of our suppliers more as partners um, and, and even the ones that aren't contracted or aren't direct at all times start thinking of more of a how are we in this together type approach. Um, that includes the communities. Obviously, um, for us, we are a major employer in most of the communities in which we operate. NGOs are becoming really important in helping build trust around the messages we're saying, but also because they're shaping conversations uh, about our industry, about our products. How can we inform them uh, in a more credible and um, more relationship-based way about what we're doing. Our customers and consumers, and I think we do need to separate those two. They're not, you know, we have customers that then sell to consumers. Are we meeting their requirements? And there are different audiences. The consumer, I remember when I started at WWF, we always thought the consumer was the, the end goal. If, if we moved consumer preference, if we talked to the public, it became clear after a couple of years that the investor frameworks were potentially where the bigger change was going to happen. And I can tell you from, from our point of view, it is our investor space that's changing more at scale. And what we're doing in the consumer space is testing some of those things, launching you know, specific targets, specific brands with claims around climate, sustainability, et cetera, to learn how to do it, and then we'll move to scale. But this is effectively why roundtables become really important for us. Um, because these people get into one room and we start discussing in a real credible way what are the actions we need to do to achieve these outcomes. So we have lots of, lots of partners in and outside the roundtables. Some of these you know, are you know, in immensely powerful groups. The World Economic Forum, um, which is a, a group of very wealthy people flying in their private jets to Davos to talk about reducing impact. Um, <laughs> the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. You know, these, 
These are effectively the way we as corporates get to engage in some of those intergovernmental spaces. Uh, we often don't get access to things like COP and uh, the UN summits. Corporates tend to be shut out of those. Um, but partnering with organisations like those, the roundtables, mean we can tell that story. Because fundamentally, coming out of the producer world, I understood that the biggest impact on the understanding and value of, of product was either coming from destructive practices, and, and Roy spoke about deforestation, or it was the reputation of big companies that was sort of you know, tarnishing you know, the way beef and, and other proteins were seen at the market. So we need to do a better job of making sure we're trusted so that we can continue to buy your products. But what are we going to need to move this? We're going to need traceability and transparency. We take for granted in Australia, New Zealand, Canada and a few others that we have a, a, a traceability system. The, the, the challenge with that is I don't yet have a traceability system that enables me to trace a carbon footprint, to trace an animal welfare claim, to trace a... And, and that's, that's selfish from my point of view. I need it to be able to tell the story. But I think we also need it for producers, because producers are doing great things. And when a producer puts her animal up to market and says it's a 450 kilo Angus steer, why not list underneath that? This is the carbon footprint. This is the animal welfare claim. And have those claims able to be brought through. I, I fear one of the risks is that I can do it as Tyson, and we'll do it in a slightly different way to JBS. Uh, to silver fern farms, and then as a farmer, the farmer will have to invest, you know, four times over in the measurement of something to meet our requirements. So finding a way to do that more holistically, I think, is better for all of us. We need to be transparent because those numbers are going to come with the good and the bad. Um, not all farmers are going to meet this ideal threshold, but what does that mean? Is that a think of it more as an inspiration for change rather than a, a penalty? We're going to need to monitor and report more clearly. We have to tell the story in a more credible way. And I'll get, I'll get to it soon, but we're really good at telling a story. But the story's wearing thin because there's a lot of numbers being thrown back at us. And those numbers are dire. I mean, the climate story is a challenge. The biodiversity loss in the developed world is a challenge. These are, these are known facts. So what are the facts about what we're doing that we can share? We need incentives. We need to invest in what, what's happening on farm. We need farmers to be supported to adopt the practices that, that lead to not only the outcomes. If you expect it from the government, then it's going to have to deliver the public good. If you expect it from me, then we can talk about you know, moving the needle in our um, frameworks and reporting and consumer spend. But we're going to need a lot of innovation and tech too. And this one gets a bit nervous. No, no doubt do we need to learn to do some things that we don't yet know how to do. Reduce methane at scale, especially in grass-fed operations, is one of those um, that we're working on. But we also need the consumer to understand that innovation and tech is going to have to be part of the food system moving forward. Because I think there's a, a slight fear around tech in food. So this is what we've done as an industry pretty well, is put out a lot of really nice tweets and stories. Uh, we've talked about you know, science and we've tried to simplify it. Um, meanwhile, the other side has gone ahead and, and put it in front of the consumer and said, here's a choice you can make in store. Next to that, you know, we have beef. Uh, and you know, guys in the room here are selling it. Um, we have beef that tells a better story than this but we're not yet able to put it at scale on a supermarket shelf. So when people go in asking for a burger of an with a good environmental footprint, they're going to the one that already is telling the story. True or not. So how do we tell that story? And we need to do it uh, pretty quickly. Not so much in this part of the world where, I'm not sure what the trend is in New Zealand, but I don't know if you ever saw the photos of COVID when meat shortages in Australia, these were the only things left on the shelf. But uh, in Asia, this stuff sells well. Um, 
I know that because we're, we're producing some of it in our paddy plants. Um, they're used to eating vegetables in funny formats. But there's also this global trend of um, you know, countries trying to become the marketplace for sustainable food. You guys have held that mantle for a long time around you know, this 100% pure, New Zealand pure, this source of clean green product. Ireland wants to be the marketplace for sustainable food through the Origin Green, 100% of food exports certified sustainable. Uh, that's their goal. Uh, and obviously you've got a, a CN30 ambition um, in Australia, 2050 here. But these, these levels of ambition have bought two things. One, they've bought interest and investment, but they've also bought time. Once you, and this is one of the reasons for setting targets becomes really important, is once you demonstrate your ambition, people understand that you're heading to the same point. You've represented your values. So s setting targets and goals that allows you to say to someone, you raise a climate, a climate issue, I agree. This is where I'm headed. But until you have that, it's a little bit difficult because it just seems like, leave us alone. Uh, we've got it under control. So be clear on what that ambition is. And finally, I think we have to give these guys a bit of slack. The consumer is usually making a decision in around three seconds on what they're seeing on pack. So um, we need to be clear in our communication. And as I said, around millennials especially, they're asking for really simplistic claims. But they've also got full-time jobs. Let's not expect them to learn the science. Let's not expect them, let's just get it right. And if we get it right and actually move the needle rather than just communicate, if we move the needle over time, this will happen. So if there's genuine change, we'll see that reflected in science, in policy, that'll help. And it, it'll be a slow burn, it has been for a while. But this, we often get told this narrative, consumers need to learn more. And I find that weird, because I'm not learning any more about cars when I'm buying a car. I'm not learning any more about light bulbs when I'm buying light bulbs. Um, why, why expect that for people who are buying our products? Thank you. <laughs> Very um, instructive. So basically, you've played both sides of the fence. Which is the best one to be on now? I, uh, Doing, doing, making the change, absolutely. Um, but that, that's a challenge too. In countries like Australia, I think it's, it's good because when we talk to the industry, the industry's got their own ambitions, understand why. Um, in parts of Asia where we're trying to achieve these global targets, but culturally, these issues aren't really being raised in, in a big way. So I can make it pay as a business offering in Europe and Australia. I don't know how I'd do that yet in Asia. Um, I'm having to pay quite a bit overs for soy to come across from South America uh, to meet our forest commitment, because no one else is asking in Asia. So um, those challenges are real, but it's a lot more fun to be trying to make it happen than throwing rocks from outside. OK, questions, please, for you. One behind the post. Oh, is it? Oh, hello. <laughs> No, they, they will be product by product. Um, but it's also worth really, Tyson is not huge in the direct-to-retail space. So we mostly work in partnership with our customers around, so it'll be our customers that communicate. So we'll deliver that strategy as a corporate across all proteins, but there will be a different product launched for beef with a different name than there will be, you know, if we launch a chicken product or a pork product. So, you know, we have uh, a raised and rooted product which is, uh, we don't use that term in antipodes, but um, in, in Asia and um, North America, raised and rooted is, is a plant-based. We're now offering a meat blend, uh, meat plant blend, um, further processed product through raised and rooted. Um, it often gets lumped in with our product responsibility area, those, and I, that frustrates me because it, 
I'm not sure if offering plant-based burgers is a product responsibility piece. It's, it's, it's a demand piece. Producing that sustainably is the, um, the responsibility bit. So no, it won't be a specific product line across all proteins. We've got the BNZ talking next. But in terms of like your shareholders, they were, they were listed there, and obviously they're a very key driver when you're a company like yours. How is that conversation going, and how do you work that into your um, broader goals? It, it's going okay the last couple of years because we're, we're also doing okay financially. Um, it's when it goes the other way that it becomes a bit of a challenge. Um, the... So there's two, the, it's worth noting that there's two kind of ways the investors ask. One is, do I feel good about putting my money in your business? And our strategies have generally said to them, yes, we're, we're trying to achieve what you want, and they've bought into that. Some of them have, in, have increased investment in specific areas to do that. The other part of our shareholders, though, and uh, there is increasing advocacy investment, where people are in buying shares purely to get votes at board meetings. That's a different style. Um, so it's in that space where we're having to catch up because they're coming in with specific aims that we think are in our strategy, but they're not seeing it called out enough. Um, so we're having to sort of prioritise to shareholders certain pieces of comms or start some new projects. So that's a slightly different bit, but generally, you know, the the strategy, the, for, the formula to feed the future, which we launched two years ago, it'll get a refresh in the next couple of months uh, to our shareholders, has met needs. Yeah. Partly because of the targets. Yeah. All right. Okay, over the back there, thank you. And then we'll come here. Oh, gee, it was cool. <laughs> Jeez, you got to be here for your four minutes. Just a, just a question around um, speed of developing a sustainable approach. There are corporates where sustainability is sort of embedded in their DNA, yeah. and then there are corporates that are doing it because they have to do it. So who's, who's make, making the most kind of speed or progress, and who would be your ultimate poster, poster person or poster corporate in terms of, wow, well, they're doing it completely? Yeah. It's an interesting one, because w- what lens do you ask? So for me, in beef, Macca's wins. It was Macca's who made sure the round table happened. It was McDonald's who brought scale to sustainable investment in, in beef globally. Does the consumer know that yet? Probably not. So um, whereas you look at other brands, A&W in Canada and others, that have, who have made more of a communications push because they're buying a smaller portion of it they can they can actually buy the stuff with more claim and tell more stories about it so I think the, it, some companies are winning the consumer race but in terms of who's driving change there are others Walmart's another at scale across a, a huge range of products that are driving change so um, it depends what you're trying to achieve uh, in our space fundamentally it'll always come down to senior leadership and I know my president of, of International, Chris Langholz, um, just personally driven in this space, sits in every sustainable sustainability working group meeting uh, to make this happen. So it's exciting to work at Tyson for that reason. So I think, I think it's one of the reasons we feel as if we're at scale playing a leadership role in sustainability. All right, there was one just over there. Thanks. Um, Ian, you mentioned a bit about how Tyson is also a big investor in the alternative protein market. So I was sort of wondering how do you, um, you know, market alternative proteins and beef at the same time without taking away from the other one? Yeah. So effectively it's just about getting protein to people uh, in a way that they'll eat it. So we don't sell it. Uh, we, we have a very small line in raised and rooted in the US, but it's bigger in Asia because they're willing to eat it. They, they like protein, plant-based proteins. They know how to cook it. They understand it. Um, so it's just about getting protein to people. Um, what we do on those packets is because it's more easy to do in those supply chains is, is report 
uh, uh, you know, a claim around climate, we put it on there. We're trying to do the same with our animal proteins, is put the same numbers on there. Uh, currently, we just can't do it. Uh, we're starting, I think we can do it uh, with some of our further processed vertically integrated chicken because we, we'll know those numbers, so we'll try that. But um, we just don't have the numbers to tell. We want to market it the same way, but currently, for beef in particular, um, we just can't put that number yet where we can on those plant-based. It makes it look like we're saying something different, but it's just about what we can and can't do right now. Yeah. For us, it's protein on a protein shelf rather than putting that in as a way of competing against our fresh meats division. I wish that was true of all the other alternative protein <laughs> marketers. Yeah. Which you don't want to be uh, wrapped up in that? No. No, we don't, we don't have a specific target of raising, raise, you know, if you look at Beyond Meat and others, some of those companies were set up too. I remember I was in Washington DC and I got asked to go to the launch of Impossible Foods Burger. And it is, it's a good product, it tastes good, tastes like a beef burger cooked on a hot plate after you've eaten cooked bacon. Gave me gas though. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the CEO was quite good, but then the owner got speaking to Tim Hardman, another bloke who was at WWF at the time, and myself, and just told us, he deliberately set this up to run our families out of business. Very different approach to why we have a raised and rooted <laughs> product. Yeah. Well, thanks for your honesty. You know, I just got one about, especially about the gas, um, I've just got one more question. Nervousness on tech and food. You want to expand on how we get around that or what we can do to... Um, where that nervousness lies and what we're doing to try and counteract that? Yeah, be clear on the why. Um, and if, if it's to reduce footprint, make sure we can tell the footprint story. Uh, so if we're feeding a, a feed additive, and with asparagopsis, the seaweed, for example, it might be okay, it's a natural product. Um, but once we start synthesising those, there's a company in Western Australia looking to synthesise that bromine product. You've got the, the DSM Bovea product. Once we start adding feed additives, let's be sure that we can communicate the outcome so that people understand, you know, I'm achieving something good by using that process. I think in the past around GM, the consumer didn't know what was in it for them. Around GM, for example, um, we didn't do a good enough job of doing that. Is time against us in, in making that progress? Uh, time's always against us, but, you know, if not now, when? Thank you very, very much, Ian. Thank you. That's great. Give him a hand, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> We're going to come to the financial part of the equation now. Uh, from BNZ, Head of Natural Capital, and uh, someone that's got a whole lot of experience. I'll let her tell you about that. Dana Muir. Thank you very much. Please make a welcome. start by saying thanks, Anne. You've um, basically given my presentation for me, actually. <laughs> it's great. Uh, look, just a quick intro from me. So I'm Dana Muir. I'm our Head of Natural Capital at BNZ. Uh, that is a um, fancy way of effectively saying my role is to look at how the bank is continually evolving, how we support our farmers and growers with what's happening from a sustainability point of view. Uh, increasingly so, that's becoming a conversation around what products we're bringing to market to incentivise those right behaviours. Um, my background is I'm a um, dry stock and dairy farmer's daughter from Taranaki, and um, my uh, education is agri-commerce, um, so I don't have a sustainability degree. But you'll see through my presentation that more and more so um, when we start talking about the future of agri, um, you've got to get yourself up to speed with some of that sustainability language, um, some of those theories, and um, often I find myself quite deep in some papers um, about corporate sustainability and learning a whole lot of new language, which I um, didn't learn at university. After university, I spent a bit of time um, travelling around some weird and wonderful places, Kazakhstan, uh, Russia, places that the... Um, global Sustainable uh, Roundtable don't have a membership base, um, probably for good reason, if you look at some of the animals in um, Kazakhstan. Um, but 
and, and a bit of time in China, um, I worked as a, um, basically looking at how we could do New Zealand style farming systems um, in some of those markets. And then I joined the bank after that, uh, did a bit of banking and then started up the natural capital team in 2018. So we've been on a bit of a journey in this space for quite a while now. Um, and it has uh, really grown legs and we'll sort of talk about where that whole investment space is going. Um, would you mind just pulling up the first slide? Lovely. So, um, a bit tongue in cheek, but you will have all been reading a few articles in probably the last 18 months about banks trying different forms of sustainable finance across different markets, not just the primary sector, um, but you would have also seen uh, some of our larger processes um, entering into the sustainably linked loan space and the sustainable finance space, um, and ourselves looking at how we actually offer these types of products to farmers as well. So we'll get into that. Um, but I also want to talk about why the red meat sector should care about this topic, right? Um, it's, it is evolving at pace, and, and, and so uh, let's dive into that. If, can I have the next slide? Is this working? Sorry? It is. Oh, cool. Oh, fab. Um, so what I'm going to do first is give effectively a bit of an executive summary of some of the things that we'll touch on within this presentation, but there's a lot here, and we've got 25 minutes, right? So... These are the types of things that I just want you to bear in mind as we go through. These are the headlines I want you to um, walk away from this uh, presentation with. So addressing climate change and other environmental and social challenges will require significant investment from public and private sector. We know that. Um, you see a lot coming out of the public sector in terms of like the SFF fund. You're seeing um, you know, ongoing conversations around how he Hekinoa will be reinvested back into R&D. You're seeing that space emerging at pace, right? Um, also the private sector, and we know that our primary sector in New Zealand is quite heavily reliant on debt, so we need to look at how we can use that private se sector uh, investment, attract new investment um, by saying these are uh, assets that are greener or that are future fit, um, but also look at how debt can also play a really key role in, in providing that uh, surety around what is um, effectively a green asset. And I use green asset in terms of, I'm not saying that uh, the primary sector is a brown asset. I'm saying that uh, when we talk in an investment context, you talk about assets across a range of sectors. So you talk about like oil and gas, for example, it is a, effectively a brown asset when we're talking from an investor point of view. I would say the New Zealand agri space is aqua, you know, in terms of its asset um, profile. And then you sort of see a range of different, um, across different sectors, you can kind of call them different, uh, different colours. The, where we want to get to is we want to make New Zealand agri, we want to show the data that says this is an aqua asset that is becoming greener. Does that make sense to everyone? I think that's just a fundamental, okay, cool. Um, the next piece I just want to touch on, and this is, I, I stand up in front of rooms of farmers and say, um, actually, the New Zealand legislative um, space in agri can actually be seen as quite a benefit to the New Zealand agri sector, and I get a whole lot of farmers that go, you are crazy. Um, but it actually is really useful in the context of what Ian was talking about earlier, that we're starting to get data, right? So the legislative environment has been really useful for us and that we're all getting to a similar baseline. So again, if we talk about those different sectors and we talk about brown sectors and those that are trying to convert to green, the New Zealand agri sector has a lot of benefit in that we're all kind of at the same baseline right now. By the end of the year, we should all know what our emissions numbers are um, we all know roughly what you know nitrogen numbers are across the farms. We all know that everyone is at a relatively similar level in terms of those plantings and fencing off waterways and things like that. So we've got a sector with a really similar baseline, which is really important again when we come back to proving those um, that what we say about those assets over there are becoming greener that we can actually verify that. And again, we're starting from a really similar position. So we do have a sector that's all in and around a same level. You think about um, a, SME, uh, like a, a small enterprise construction business or something like that. How the heck do you even start having a conversation around how to know your emissions profile if you're, in the if you're a um, small building firm, you know? So actually, lots of benefits. Um, in where we're at as a sector. 
Um, the New Zealand primary sector has a strong reputation globally, including for its environmental and social progress, with assurance programs and foundational structures in place. So we come back to that assurance program space, and we know that the assurance program space is saying, we've got legislation, and then we're asking for you to come into the assurance program, we're asking for a little bit more than what legislation's asking for, because that's what our, uh, the conscious consumer is demanding of us. And so those assurance programs, again, give us that data so we can sort of talk about our story on a global stage. There's also a piece of work called SAFI, and I know that um, Blake Holgate from Rabo, he came and spoke a few years ago, if anyone was here then, uh, around um, what SAFI was all about. Uh, I went the same day and spoke to the uh, dairy climate change ambassadors about, we gave the same presentation. So um, all of the banks got in a room, all of the rural lenders in New Zealand got in a room. We looked at globally where the guidelines were around what was sustainable agriculture for the finance sector. So there's a whole lot of guidelines that are sort of being worked out globally. We took some drafts of those, brought them into a New Zealand context, ran them past a bunch of assurance um, providers and then said, okay, this is what we think. If we're going to call um, something sustainable finance in a New Zealand agri context, these are the guidelines that basically we'll play to. So that if we want to call it sustainable agricultural finance, we've set about basically a New Zealand context for that. Um, so that's been in place for about 18 months and is a really important piece of work that drives a great deal of the work that's gone on since then in the investment space. Um, you'll see, and Ian, you spoke about it earlier, organisations are seeing pressure from new sources. So I have spoken to a number of the big four accounting firms, and one of the key things they're talking about with boards at the moment is that people need to start getting their sustainability strategies in order. So, when we, so we're mainly talking about listed companies and corporates here, right? So when the big four are sitting down at those boardroom tables, they're saying that increasingly... Your financial reporting will be really important and we'll audit that, but increasingly your sustainability strategy and the trajectory of travel within your sustainability reporting is going to become almost as important as your financial reporting. Um, in terms of how sustainable finance is starting to play into this, the emissions reduction plan uh, earlier this year called out sustainable finance as a key tool. In, to support the sector, to support a number of sectors with transitioning to more greener practices. Um, but increasingly so, you're seeing providers of capital, aka banks, start to play in the space and start to look at what types of tools they can release to different sectors to help them on their journey. The final thing I'll just say on this slide is that my view here is we are entering a really interesting era where corporate sustainability targets will dramatically influence uh, funding and investment decisions. And so when I talk about the agri landscape, I think that this is going to increasingly be a really important element that drives where the sector goes in terms of reducing emissions, in terms of that ESG conversation. So probably since before I was born, uh, the sector has been talking about the volume to value conversation, right? You've been to a million conferences. I actually cringe when I hear that saying these days because I've heard it so many times. But I, um, it's the conversation around like where do we get our premiums from, right? So if we're farmers and we're doing all this work to become um, the best versions of ourselves and prove our story and tell our story, can we get a premium for that? I found a headline from the New Zealand Herald recently that said, is the volume to value mantra true? Yes, and here's why. Well done. We've done it. We've moved from a commodity um, sector to a uh, values-based sector. Um, it's probably not quite that simple, but that's a really good headline, right? Then, or I sit down at a lot of tables with farmers and they say to me, but we're not seeing that premium flow through to us. And then the conversation becomes about access. So then you have the conversation of, but if I don't do this, am I going to get access to those markets? So here's a headline. EU and New Zealand seal trade deal with tougher new green rules. So you're, we're, not, we're entering a phase now where you're not going to get access to certain markets unless you can prove out those sustainability credentials across our products, right? We have a really great story, which Ian sort of talked about in terms of we're clean, we're green, the world knows that. But 
resting on our laurels is really not an option for us, given that that is our baseline. We're coming off a baseline of we're clean, we're green. This is a great story. Lots of um, markets in the world think we're probably already regenerative while we're here kind of having a discussion about what that actually means. Um, so we can't really rest on our laurels. And then that, that, that premium versus access conversation starts to flow into the investment space as well. So what we're already seeing is if you're a farmer and you're looking for a new bank to go and bank with, but you've just been through the uh, courts for breaking your cow's tails, or you don't have your effluent pond up to scratch, you don't have consents, you're letting a bit of effluent run through the waterways, you're letting your cows in to the waterways, those sorts of things, and you're getting fines, it's going to be very hard for you to find a bank that wants to take you on. So we're already at a place where access to capital is a struggle for that bottom, uh, if you think about that bell curve, that bottom end of the bell curve, right? So you need to be able to prove to us that you're at a minimum meeting regulation, otherwise it is going to be a really tricky conversation for you with the bank when it comes to um, trying to move from one bank to another. And then you get into the conversation of the premium, right? So we're already at a place where access to capital is reliant on you uh, just meeting minimum standards in terms of environmental and social aspects. Where can the premium come into this? I suppose that's where the sustainable finance conversation can be a part of this as well. So talking about if a bank offers different forms of finance that offer interest rate benefits for improving those environmental and social aspects, and when I talk about in, the, in a farming context, you want to be talking more about like that assurance program level, right? So the top end of town, over and above regulation. If we can start to see farmers moving into that space, is there actually a really big opportunity for banks to offer different forms of incentive-based lending to them? We think yes. So banks, first and foremost, we have to put our um, we have to put our money where our mouth is, right? So there's a really big role for us here in terms of uh, before we go out to our customer base and ask them to do a whole lot of things we need to make sure that we're doing the right things ourselves. So I stole this um, slide from the sustainability team who actually have sustainability uh, degrees, which is useful. Um, and they sort of talk about a number of pillars that the bank needs to meet um, as an organisation so that we can um, then go out and talk about sustainable finance and talk about different initiatives that we're doing to support our customers um, on the journey. So we talk about transparent leadership, growing our people. Um, one of the big focuses I've always had in the natural capital team is making sure that our agribankers, when they go on farm, they don't need to be experts, but they need to be enablers of um, that environmental conversation, right? So right now, one thing that I'm saying to our bankers, and it's super simple, is when you're going on to a um, sheep and beef farm, gently remind farmers that by the end of the year we all need to know our numbers. So if you don't have that greenhouse gas emissions um, calculator done on your farm, worth doing that in the next couple of months. Um, so just things like that, really, really simple messages, but usually when the bank sits down at the table and asks for something, people tend to listen, and we know that role, right? Um, there's a whole lot of other ones. We're greening our own operations, hardwiring sustainability into everything that we do, and this is really true. Um, so very much BAU now, uh, not just for roles like my, my own, but I sit on our agri-leadership team, and our agri-business leadership team gets pulled into probably two sustainability meetings a week. Um, that was not heard of about six months ago. We also have a sustainable finance target. So we have a target to achieve $10 billion of sustainable finance by 2025 as a bank across all sectors, not just primary sector. That's about 10% of our loan book. So it's really quite chunky, to, and, and it's a really big ask to get that amount of debt onto some form of sustainable finance. There are two really important things that the banking sector has, uh, is obligated and, or has um, voluntarily committed to that I just want to touch on. And you'll, the, the, these two phrases will become increasingly familiar to you over the coming years. So firstly, TCFD, um, there'll be lots of people in this room who are, are sitting on corporate boards that already understand what TCFD is. So the regulator has said to effectively all the listed companies in New Zealand, by 2025, you need to be able to report publicly on your scope one, two, and three emissions. So scope three emissions for BNZ is our financed emissions, right? So the customers that we finance, that comes into our overall emissions profile, which we need to report on. So that means that we need to report on our agricultural emissions. 
And again, that comes back to that point that I made earlier, right, around how helpful it is that we're actually at a point in the sector where by the end of the year, we should actually all know what our number is. Again, a really useful element when everyone's going to have to report on emissions. There's a wider conversation around how everyone accesses that data, if insurance agencies, if um, you know all of the processes, if all of the banks are going to farmers asking for that same data, those farmers aren't going to love that, so we need to find other ways to access that data. But by 2025, all of the banks and all of the listed companies in New Zealand are going to have to report on their emissions, which will include those scope through emissions from farmers. There's also uh, a thing called the Net Zero Banking Alliance. This is an, it's the NZBA. This is an optional, um, uh, an optional framework which you can sign up to. It's global. 40% of the global banking assets are already uh, incorporated in that NZBA target, including all of the large rural lenders in New Zealand. Um, Westpac signed up last week and they were the last to do so, so we're all signed up to it now. The obligations within NZBA is that within 18 months of, months of signing up to um, NZBA, you need to be able to prove what you're doing as a business to support your financed emissions to transition to greener operations. So that means in the next 18 months, BNZ is going to need to be able to say, across all of our different sectors, here are the things that we're doing to help um, our customers with their environmental and social targets. So I just want to quickly run through, um, and, I, and I have been rambling on a little bit, but I just want to quickly run through some farmer stats um, that we see from, uh, we go out every 18 months and we survey our farmers and we say, tell us about if all of this change that's happening in your business right now, if that's an opportunity or a threat to the future of your business. In 2020, we saw about 60% of our farmers said it's an opportunity, we're really excited about the future. Um, when we asked that September 2021, it was a 50-50 split. And there wasn't one demographic that was um, that you could pinpoint that was more optimistic or feeling more threatened about the future. It was really, really clear. There wasn't a sector, there wasn't like a debt profile, a profitability profile, an age, anything that we could pinpoint that said that's we, we understand why they're feeling a little bit more threatened. So we've got this um, really interesting time in the sector where you've just got this incredible split. Like you saw it with the Lake Hawia station. Um, commentary that came out, right? You saw half the sector kind of come out and say, this is amazing. What a, They know exactly who their end customer is and they are telling that story brilliantly to that customer and they're getting data in behind them to back it up. And then you saw the other half of the sector go, how dare these newcomers come in here and tell us how the best way to farm and feel really threatened about that conversation. Both really interesting arguments, both have their merits, right? But it is, it was, uh, I observed that and saw Yep, you've got, you really do have a 50-50 split in terms of farmer mindset, right? We also ask them, we give them a list of 30 megaforces and we say, tell us which of these megaforces is really starting to, um, give us your top 10 megaforces in terms of what's influencing on your business. When we, and we say, tell us about that now in 2021 and then tell us about that in 2030 as well. So give us a look forward of what megaforces you think will be influencing your business. Um, what we saw here is about six of these kind of relate to environmental and social factors. Um, the rise of the conscious consumer is number three. The increased focus on climate change, number five. Increasing innovation, number seven. When we asked this in 2030, seven of those become environmental and social, right? What we see here, though, is increasing innovation moves to number one. Uh, increased focus on climate change drops to number nine. So we could sit here all day and talk about what that means in terms of um, the reliance that we're placing on innovation to solve some of these climate change issues for us. Um, but what I'm really interested in talking about is the rise of the conscious investor. So the rise of the conscious consumer stays about the same, and we'd expect that, right? The rise of the conscious investor, it wasn't on the top 10 list in 2021, and I didn't expect to see it on the list in 2030 either but it's about halfway up, right? So that tells us that our farmers actually really understand, like what we've just been talking about, it's already in their thinking, right? People are already starting to understand that the investor space, that um, corporate sustainability space is going to become fundamental in the future of farming. Yeah. 
So we, we asked them both at the same time. So September in 2021, we said, um, tell us about what you think of the megaforces in 2021, and then also tell us about what you think they'll be in 2030. Um, and so the only part I want you to focus on on this side is we said, righto, tell us then about if all of these mega forces are coming into play, tell us about what innovations you're looking to see from the sector to support you with achieving some of those environmental and social targets. And we asked them if bank debt to incentivise positive environmental and social progress was of interest, and 50% of our farmers and growers said it was. And this is very much in line with what we're seeing globally. So in the interest of time, I'll just focus on uh, the slide on the... On, your left. <laughs> um, and this is about sustainable finance and the rise of banks issuing different forms of sustainable finance around the world. So what you see here is mainly driven out of Europe. That's the predominant market. It's, um, it's been evolving since 2015, since the Paris Agreement. So actually the World Bank uh, offered the first form of sustainable finance in 2008, but since 2015 you've really seen a rapid uptake here. The New Zealand market is slower to move, but it's coming, it's coming slowly. Um, traditionally, you've seen really sophisticated forms of sustainable finance uh, being offered. So green bonds, social bonds, um, where basically you're offering out to investors, uh, usually for like building um, uh, gr uh, green star commercial buildings or something like that. So that's usually the space that we've been playing in. But what I'm really interested in is the green um, graphs here and the rise of sustainably linked loans. So that's your usual term debt and you're linking it to a set of pre-agreed environmental and social targets across your business. So you use that term debt for whatever purposes you were gonna use the term debt for originally, but you're just tagging it to a set of environmental and social targets. To me, that is right for the taking to support the agri sector with the goals that they're undertaking across their business. We're not asking to um, put in more debt, we're saying you can take your existing debt and you can roll that into a, into a sustainably linked loan that is tagged to a set of pre-agreed environmental and social targets. We see that as incredibly exciting and a really cool um, tool in the toolbox which farmers can choose to take up. It's not something we're going to be saying is compulsory, absolutely not, you can just get your usual term debt. But if you're one of those farmers that, especially those ones in assurance programs, that are wanting, are already driving to go harder and faster than legislation, um, and are in those assurance programs particularly, we see this as a really great option to also, um, it's more cash in your back pocket. It's more um, premium that you could be receiving. So a good example of this is a farmer that's already in the Fonterra COP difference. It's effectively a very similar model, right? You're just taking two different ways of looking at it. So that Fonterra COP difference, extra seven cents if you achieve a couple of environmental and social targets across, um, across your business and then Fonterra can prove that you've done that, then you get the seven cents. Very similar concept to sustainably linked loans and what BNZ has just released to the market as well for all mum and dad farmers to take advantage of. Um, so again, we don't expect that this will be the right product for everyone, but we think it's a really nice idea um, for those that want it and also want to reap the benefits in terms of strategic alignment. Ian also touched on, um, it's about partnering with your investors or partnering with your financiers on the journey that you're on. And that is definitely what we've seen from um, releasing this type of product to the market. Actually, it's a really nice way to strategically align the direction that your business is taking. Um, here's three examples of uh, names that you will all be familiar with who have done sustainably linked loans in the last 12 months. Um, so Silver Fern Farms and, a, and, the, uh, and, and t Turners and Growers and the wider primary sector supply chain have both just engaged in um, sustainably linked loans for their sectors, which is very cool. Um, and then Southern Pastures, Southern Pastures were very gracious, uh, they own Lewis Road Creamery. They were very gracious in working with us on the pilot for the sustainably linked loan product um, so that we could test it out in the market and see if actually an incentive-based lending product would work for farmers and growers. Um, we've seen some really great success from releasing it and we think that we're on the right track with where we're kind of taking the sustainable finance market for farmers and growers across the country. I, will, um, I might actually just leave it on the slide so you can have a read of it and then um, I know I'm probably a little bit over time. So, um, thank you so much. I've got so many questions around the um, around the mental health component of all this, and, and I think if you're around for the um, yeah. panel discussion, we'll ask a few of those. Just briefly, anybody got anything? Uh, just before. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Just grab that microphone if you would. More for the people that Cheers, are on mate. the web. Thanks. Hey, um, uh, a couple of things. It's about the cost of finance. Mm-hmm. So where does your ability to come to give, say, farmers a, a reduced interest rate... So I get the seven cents from the frontier because they can take their product, get more out of the market. But where does, where does, the, where does finance be able... Because you've got to make money. How does it happen if you're lending your money at a low rate? This will be something that you'll never hear a bank say. We're taking a hit at the moment on that. So we... Look, we, we see this as being a really useful tool that, one, that eventually either the market will reward us for with cheaper capital or the Reserve Bank will recognise and provide that ability to us. Um, at the moment, the price is pretty thin that we can offer because it is us taking a um, hit to our return on equity um, across our agri book. But we see this as the right thing to be doing. Um, again, we, we recognise that it's not going to be the product for everyone, so we're pretty comfortable with where we've landed at the moment because we see we need to go and do this because right now is when farmers need this. Um, but look, over time, we'd love to say that we'll get some relief on the other side of it, but at the moment, we're taking the hit. Okay, second, second question, if I may, the 2025 date was, um, was great to hear, and that kind of ties into Hiwakura Kanoa versus farms or agriculture going into the um, ETS. So how's your view on that? Do you think the um, uh, Hiwakura Kanoa is going to be accepted by the government, or are we going to put agriculture in the ETS? Look... My, I'll give quite a political view here. Um, uh, sorry, an apolitical view here. Uh, it, again, it comes back to however it comes in. We know the target that the sector has by 2030, so 10% across the sector by 2030. Um, for me, in terms of this piece, it doesn't matter so much in terms of how we come into either the ETS or the, whether we get Hiwaki Kinoa, although I personally have a view, obviously Hiwaki Kinoa is what we want um, and is what has been kind of like pushed across the sector, um, but we will just kind of wait and see sort of how that emerges and we'll, we'll play whatever bat we're given, um, but we know the trajectory of travel and so our message really clearly to farmers at the moment is we know where we have to get to by 2030, how that mechanism comes in, how we're priced is kind of irrelevant to the fact that we we know the trajectory of travel, so it's it's time to kind of start moving. Thank you. Cool. Okay, so uh, it's going to be smoko time now. Cup of tea. Um, thank you so much, and please give her a round of applause. I do have a lot of. <laughs> right. We'll start with. Uh, out further ado, that's the lady right there that I'm going to introduce first. Kelly Drake, 2002, SPCA Certified Animal Welfare Partnership, uh, involved in farm animal welfare the last 25 years, regional council, uh, research scientist, um, industry, uh, spent a lot of time in industry in uh, New Zealand, um, Australia and the UK. So thank you for being a part of our panel today. Uh, Dr Jean Roche, um, Government MPI Chief Science Advisor. He has a list of things that are 300 miles long of what he has done. Uh, he's been a sci- five years as a senior scientist at the Department of Primary Industries, Victoria, Australia. Um, six years with the Dairy Research Corporation in Dexel in New Zealand. Um, yeah, 11 years in animal science team at Dairy NZ. So there is a fair bit of experience there and we really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Uh, we were going to have Richard Schofield, but he's dropped the ball and run away. And in his place, <laughs> in his place, he's put Anthony Dark. Now, Anthony is a king country farmer. Where are you, Anthony? Stepped in at the last minute. Impact player, I think they call him in rugby. So let's hope you have a little more success than Fozzie does. Um, Aria is where he makes home sheep and beef farmer up there. And uh, he's here to give us a farmer's perspective. Uh, we'll move to Susie Craig next, retail and uh, slash McDonald's, a sustainable supply and Quality Manager, Susie leads work on McDonald's sustainable sourcing priorities in New Zealand and Australia, including work on beef sustainability, which is the core of McDonald's commitment to use its scale for good, and also a NZRSB board member. Thank you so much, Susie. That's great. Uh, Then we move to um, Matt Luxon, and uh, Matt Luxon is a Strategic Program Sales Manager at Silver Fern Farms. 
says a lot about everything, really, to be honest. Um, he's leading the charge as far as uh, the grass, largest grass-fed lamb, beef and venison producer and global sustainable meat exporter. Uh, Matt has dual expertise in sustainable food production and marketing. Prior to this, he was the country manager for Silver Fern Farms in North America. Huge uh, stuff behind him, and once again, another board member. Uh, is dabbled in the maritime as well, so, yeah. Plenty of experience there. And then there's little old me. Um, I'm Craig Wiggins. I started up whatever with Wiggy uh, Wellness and um, Health Facilitating. Uh, during COVID, we had Zoom meetings for farmers every Thursday night, basically to keep them alive and keep some contact going with them. Um, I've uh, been the host of the Young Farmer of the Year contest a fair few years ago when young Sarah over the back was a competitor for very many years uh, with a lot of success. And uh, also this year's, or last year's I should say, um, Agricultural Ravenstown Agricultural Communicator of the Year for my work in mental health and wellbeing. So the way this panel is going to work is we're going to throw some questions at uh, our people up there. And I'm going to go straight to you, Kelly, for a start. I have a small list of questions here. Primary issues for SBSA and the wider lens of sustainability. What are their biggest hurdles in making progress? Who can help making progress in this space? And how will we know if it's working and if we're making progress? So if you grab that microphone there. Thank you. Um, that's a big question. Well, we'll I'll, I'll probably I'll probably have to start at one end, and then you have to remind me what I was what I was actually talking that's about. Fine. Um, so obviously, from uh, SPCA, we're looking at things from an animal welfare perspective, and I think the first question uh, was um, the challenges around sustainability. Was that right, Craig? Yeah, primary issues for SBCA in the wider lens of sustainability and yeah. what are their biggest hurdles in making progress? Yeah, so I suppose um, in, in terms of that, for us at this point, it would be looking at and trying to encourage um, moving from five freedoms of animal welfare into the five domains um, and trying to incorporate that into the sustainability model. Um, a lot of the, there's a lot of bigger things out there like uh, freshwater regulations and climate change that have a lot of focus either from a global perspective or from regulations. And I know that animal welfare has a lot of focus on regulations, but it doesn't, it's not always as big from an animal welfare perspective. So it's just trying to include that as a, I suppose, as a driver for everything that we do in regards to sustainability. So, um, uh, and, you know, recently we uh, put sentience as one of the most important things in the Animal Welfare Act. So how do we encourage that and understand what it actually means? So the five domains is one way that we would try and put it out there to people, educate people about what it means and how we can utilise it and how to incorporate it into, you know, everyday farming. Um, so that's one way we're looking at it. Um, what was the rest of your question, Craig? Yeah, just how are you progressing in that space? How are you educating farmers? And yeah, so as as part of that, um, the SPCA is well known for its inspectorate arm for companion animals and um, for being about cats and dogs. But we're also about all other animals because it's SPCA, which is um, for all animals. So we work a lot with... Um, uh, cross cross sector uh, organisations in terms of if we're looking at it in farmed animal welfare, we have um, we're involved in a lot of um, boards. For example, Jess Blair sits on the um, Sustainable Beef Board, so she's involved there. We also have other players all across SPCA who are involved in talking with everyone, uh, be it research. So working with ag research. Uh, working with Hawk Research. Um, we also uh, try and attend conferences to talk about what we're doing. Um, some of our programs also involve uh, farmed animal certification. But if we put that to the side, we engage a lot with farmers. So, for example, I was probably on farm last week, um, a dairy farm, a, a poultry farm and a pig farm, talking about various issues, um, talking about the science from overseas and what we could do to help support what's happening over here. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of things that are happening overseas that will come you know, to New Zealand eventually. So I did pick up on one of, I think it was Dana, um, one of the points about um, 
uh, investors um, and conscious investors. So um, the business benchmark for animal welfare is a big one overseas. Trillions of dollars are invested into the BB4, and that revolves around um, transparency of animal welfare. So what does it mean for New Zealand? You know, that's coming, it's important, and it's building. Um, I think Fonterra is one of the um, big companies that are within the BB4, um, McDonald's, a bunch of others, so it is coming. Um, so those are one of the things that we try and educate people about. Anybody have any questions before I do them all? Okay, uh, so there was just recently, there, I did some work with a, a sustain, uh, SPCA approved uh, pig farm. Um, they were having trouble and it made television, et cetera, et cetera. But um, tell us a little bit about being an approved SPCA farm and what that means to the farmers and then when it lands in the bank's door. Um, good question. Um, I've worked with the, same, with the same farm as well. Um, so uh, to be the, part of that program is just incremental change for farmers. So it depends on where you want to be, um, and it's not for everyone, but there are some uh, farms who may be interested in applying for that program, and it does focus primarily on animal welfare. We're not experts in sustainability. Um, we look at the animal welfare specifically, and it's about incremental change. So we actually work with a number of farms who may not actually even join the program later on down the track, but it's an opportunity for them to engage with us to say, okay, where are we at? Or benchmark themselves against um, the standards that we have. And, you know, we're always open to talking about, you know, how you can make those incremental improvements. It's not about, you know, jumping from uh, step one to step 10 in any way. And what we'd like to see is that more people um, pay for the product, because basically what's your return on investment if you joined? I mean, you want to get something from it, Part of it is pride, um, but also there needs to be something that you get back from it. So, you know, that's the kind of angle that we are working on and working forwards in terms of engaging with supermarkets, retailers, cafes, um, and the like. But also those types of things are getting pushed back um, from overseas as well and what, um, you know, the bigger customers want. Um, Third-party accreditation, that type of thing. So we, we try and work across the board, but it's not specifically to say join the program. It's just to work on, um, look, like everyone, we all want the best welfare for our animals. Could you pass the microphone to Dan, please? Sure. Dan, we talked about those farmers that are at the lower end of the bell curve on, on many things, and animal welfare is, is of, it's quite often a sign of those lower farmers um, struggling. How do we use these tools that we've talked about here to um, raise that bottom of the curve or get them into that bell curve in a better space? Um, well, firstly, uh, if you're looking for incentives um, to join SPCA, do I have a product for you? No, just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, look, I think uh, the... So, it, if we think about that bell curve, right, a bank is always going to have risk measures in place so that we are uh, trying to identify and support those that are um, at the bottom end of that bell curve. So m most banks, I would say all banks, have some form of like an ESG checklist, which kind of uh, a banker runs through when they're doing their usual sort of credit process that has a look at like environmental aspects, social aspects, governance aspects, and animal welfare being part of that, right? So there's some... There's some baseline risk stuff that banks do that just sort of covers the bottom end risk. At the other end of the spectrum, there is things like what I was talking about earlier with sustainable finance, right? Where if they're joining programs such as the SPCA accreditation, and I know a couple of like BNZs, um, especially I'm thinking of one in particular, a poultry farmer, and he has recently... Um, started working with the SPCA around getting accredited under their scheme. That would be, again, that comes back to that um, differentiation between like legislation and sort of the assurance programs and, and differentiating between the two. So things like the SPCA assurance program would be what I would say is like that assurance program space, so it would be ripe for 
sustainable finance, if that makes sense. So there's the risk piece over here, which is just about BAU managing the agri portfolio, and then there's the opportunity for those that are going over and above to start taking advantage of things like sustainable finance and start reaping some of those incentive-based programs that are there to support them because they are doing that extra work and going that extra mile. Thanks. Could you pass that to John, please? <coughs> John, uh, with all of the work that SBCA are doing in the welfare space, what partnership and alliance does MPI put on that over the noise that has been created by the activist space? So my, I guess my question is, are you supporting SBCA in being that um, generic leader that we've had in well, animal welfare across the world versus what's become a modern ideology? Uh, so the short answer to that question would be yes, we are supporting the SPCA um, both in support and, and through funding, uh, but obviously animal welfare is bigger than that across New Zealand, so we've got our own team in animal welfare as well, both animal welfare policy as well as boots on the ground, unfortunately dealing with the individuals that, that you mentioned more often than not. Um, we offer a secretariat for NAWAC, which is the Minister's um, Independent Advisory um, Committee, and they... Uh, but but in the interests of their independence and also our own independence and our, our need to do to enact regulations, we do keep that at a at a hand's distance or an arm length. Um, so sorry, without rabbiting on, short answer is very much supportive of it. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning and hear the speakers this morning because I think that is key. And I think uh, one of the one of the issues that we're all collectively dealing with is the if you build it, they will come scenario where the evidence of the need for change is only crystallizing now. I mean, in, in listening to Dana's presentation this morning, um, or before, before morning tea, um, really brought that home to me as well. Uh, so in, in the Ministry for Primary Industries, we, we stress the fact we're the ministry for the primary industries. We are here to back the primary industries to win. Um, my director general is, is really hot on that, that we are public servants, we are here to serve the public and to serve the primary sector, um, but we do have regulations that we have to enact. Now, we'd much prefer to actually sit down and work with people to get to the outcomes that we all want to achieve, but unfortunately, there's a bottom line that we have to ma maintain from a legal perspective as well. But just listening to the conversation this morning, it, for me, it was incredibly uplifting to hear the number of initiatives that are happening to actually bring uh, farmers and processors along on this journey as partners rather than as, as a regulator. Uh, if you go one, with that microphone one, and I'll come back to the two in the middle, I'm sort of doing a progressive chain here. Um, Matt, tell me, SBCA or animal welfare, obviously a big selling point and obviously a big requirement for silver fern farms. Talk us through a little bit about where you see that space fitting with, with you on an international level. Yeah, it's, it's almost getting to a uh, table stake internationally from a consumer's perspective, so um, it may not be there yet because there's some bad players in the international market, but um, our position historically has possibly been a little bit better than it is now, um, and that just is almost sitting back on our laurels, um, which was me mentioned before. Um, we haven't had the legislative change, and I know that is hard for farmers when you do have uh, things like tethering um, dogs and those kind of things. There's inter international players that are moving in that space and then therefore elevating above us. Um, the consumer is definitely aware of it. Um, the specifics they're not necessarily looking at. <coughs> it is the overall position of a country when it comes down to animal welfare. It leads into FAP+. Plus. Obviously, we all know what that's about. Uh, the advancement of that and the pillars Animal welfare is obviously a huge pillar inside that program. Processes in the room that are um, supporting farmers through that process. Um, and it's hugely important from a consumer's pers perspective. Okay, could we come back to Susie with that mic, please? Susie, the consumer, how, how aware are they that their burger has good animal welfare standards? And how do you guarantee that when, as we said earlier on, I think it was Ian said the consumer is just busy, they just want to go and pick up what they get and, and go from there. How do you touch stone that? Um, I think that's really important um, for, for 
brand um, perspective, particularly McDonald's, which is a large global brand, um, our consumers kind of that, that brand trust aspect plays a really critical role. So I think um, when consumers come to McDonald's, they just have the expectation that we've that we're we're doing things responsibly and we're doing things right. So we invest a huge amount um, of resource in our business globally to, to make sure that we really do uphold our, our standards um, and that we have processes in our supply chain to, you know, to make sure that we're delivering against customers' expectations um, and and that we're not going to um, be on the front page of the of the mainstream media because um, somebody's found an issue in our, in our supply chain um, that that can be linked to to our brand ultimately forgive my ignorance but as a consumer how do we find out that McDonald's is investing so much back into this yeah it's a tricky one and I think um, Ian touched on it earlier when um, when the when the question was asked around um, you know who who's doing a good job in regards to communicating to, to the consumer. And it's challenging, right, because as consumers, there's, you know, there's only so much capacity that we have to, um, to really want to know about stuff. Um, so, you know, from a McDonald's perspective, um, you know, we can go out there and talk a lot about what, what we're doing, but, um, you know, are, are the consumers really having the, the, the mind to, to, take, to take that in? amongst all of the other things that they're, they're busy doing on in their in their life. Always, so, yeah, yeah, I think it's, you know, really um, important then further back down the supply chain, I guess, what, you know, how, how that education is, is delivered. Um, you know, programs like, um, you know, SPA's programs, which are educating consumers or, you know, in particularly appealing to those consumers that really are looking for, for more information. I'd play devil's advocate here and say that an old fellow like me used to have to go to the library or read an encyclopedia, but if you want to know anything about a product now, you can just pick up one of these and, and find out everything you want to know. So Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks. Can you pass that to the last man standing down there? Anthony, as the, um, <laughs> <laughs> as the producer, as the farmer, you've heard from all of the industry players around animal welfare. Have you got a dog tied to a chain at home? Twelve. Yeah. <laughs> so, how does that make you feel about changing your day-to-day um, -day regimes? What your grandparents have done, what you've done, um, what you continue to do, and if the dogs have—I've got... I've seen some pretty flash dog kennels, even with a chain, um, and strategically um, put put up. You know. So, how do you feel about those perception changes that you might have to make that you don't agree with? I'll start with the dog one. The dog kennels are all brand new, insulated, and uh, they're fairly luxurious for a dog. <laughs> and they do enjoy it. And we also use blankets, uh, um, coats in the winter, that Velcro up underneath them. So we do get negative, negative two on a bad frost in the king country. So we're aware of that. Uh, water is fed in our, our feeding regime. We don't like dogs to get down to two lower condition schools. They are a mainstay for me. My workmates are dogs, not people. So I spend days with them. And I expect a lot from them, to be fair, as well. I've got a young hitting dog that loves it. You can't stop her. She'll run all day. You have to stop her. Uh, the next part of the question is um, what my grandfather and father did on the farm. Dehorning is that one thing that I grew up with. Um, without uh, uh, pain injections, That's that got stopped, you can correct me on this, seven years ago? Yeah. And debutting, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, so we don't we don't have cars, so don't debud. But the dehorning thing is is now uh, a vet has to be present for all of that. So do you think it's just a progression of of how you are starting to to acclimatise into what society wants? That as well as also for me an on farm production effect as well. Cutting the horns off an animal is a terrible thing to do, and it, there's a product loss as a result of that. Mm. So it's in my benefit to to head down the right track on that one. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's an obvious and an easy change. Uh, around yarding, um, our yards are all up to speed. We get audited on that. Our, uh, for this is beef, I appreciate, but we've got bull sheets as well with sheep. The grating has to be checked. Our laid out races, our shearing facilities are all audited every, and if Aaron was here, he'd tell me, 18 months, I think I audit um, 
is on a rotation. So uh, we go through that every, every 18 months. Um, but yeah, if your animals are under pressure, they will not perform. So it pays to have stocking rates right and rotation lengths right and, and your system in a, in a state that is performing because if you don't, you will fall down in the, in the public eye, but you will fall down your bank balance as well. Thanks. Um, for those that don't know out there, the Mayfield dog sale the other day, the average price was $4,500. The high price was over eleven. So you are going to look after that huge investment. That doesn't surprise me at all. Mm, that is hard to find as good stuff. Um, John, I guess uh, as the human welfare component up here, um, with my work in, in um, mental wellbeing and stuff, occasionally I get the odd vet ring me up and say, I've got... Um, someone with the MBOVIS for the second time and they've not in a good space and they've just, um, they've just docked their heifer's tails. And so fortunately I had some contacts in the MPI and said, look, we need you to come in here with a, a welfare-based stick uh, carrot, not a um, regulatory stick. What education do you put at grassroots level to um, help these young, these people that you've got coming on farm and might be faced with some of these SPCA uh, animal welfare type situations because they're a big indicator for poor mental health. Uh, yeah, you're, you're right. Could I just add to the, the previous answer before I answer that one? And that's, um, you, you mentioned that we're seeing a progression as society demands it. I think we're also seeing a progression as farmers become better informed about the I impact of what we do. So like if I, I go back to my father's stories of, of cows grazing up to, the, uh, sorry, standing inside in water up to their bellies to avoid the warble fly back in the 1960s before we eradicated it, you know, there was no, no thought given to water quality at the time. And as we learned, we've, we've improved and we've, you know, we've fenced waterways all over the country, et cetera. So, um, uh, look, our, our, as, I, as I said last time, our main goal is to work with people to achieve the outcomes that we all want to achieve. And you're absolutely right. In the majority of acute animal welfare cases that we deal with, there's generally a mental health issue at the same time. Um, and so, uh, generally speaking, that is us coming on board, A, make sure the animals are looked after, whatever's gone wrong, that that gets started, and that there's an education process with the farmer. Prosecutions are generally as a result of repeated offenses. Um, and there are people that are not listening to that education. And, and then the most ex severe outcomes of those that you'll see in the press are generally speaking people that are recidivist offenders and the judge has just had enough. Um, so our, f um, and, and obviously we've got a rural support uh, team out there in the regions. We support the rural support trust um, financially um, and have expanded that significantly throughout the Bovis campaign and throughout COVID. Um, and Bovis has been tough. Um, look, I don't think anyone would deny the fact that we didn't do it well to begin with as a, as a ministry or as a collection ourselves, Beef and Lamb, Dairy and Z, collectively we probably didn't do it as well as we could. We never had a bigger, as, as big a response to deal with in the past uh, and so it was kind of designing the plane to build a plane while flying a plane and, and human beings at the end of that immediately. Um, uh, I came into MPI in 2018 so we were a year into it at that stage um, I didn't, I, when, I, when I signed on the contract, I didn't realize we'd be eradicating. The government decided that uh, three days before I arrived in MPI. Um, and um, our director general came in six months later. My, one of the first significant jobs he gave me was to dive into Bovis and to see what was wrong. So 2019, I, and it's, it's available online, so anyone, anyone could go and look at it. I gave a fairly damning report of, of what we were doing. Um, on, and over a weekend, we sat down, we, we developed a 10-point plan on how we were going to turn this around. And what we're seeing now in Bovis is a result of that weekend's work, I think. Um, and great people right throughout the program. Sorry, that wasn't um, meant to cast aspersions on the, on the majority of people. Excuse me. Um, I, um, my father dealt with TB eradication and brucellosis eradication in Ireland. And so I spent a lot of nights on the phone to him talking about what the government was doing and what the government should be doing. Um, trying to get an old wise counsel um, on where we wanted to get to. Um, and look, his, his advice to me was, you, you just stick to the facts. Um, principles will win out in the day. And um, look, I won't mention any names, but there is, there's individuals that really stood up to be counted in that process to get us to turn Bovis around. So, sorry, it's an addition to your question, but I think it is an important context. Um, we now have a group of people dedicated 
to far more recovery, not just the business recovery in that BOVIS program. And that all came out of that iteration. I mediated a meeting between those uh, farmers with the Mbovis early on and Ray Smith when he'd only had the job for two weeks at Ashburton. Yeah. It was a pretty hot meeting, but um, when you have the commissioner stand up and say, uh, this is akin to my wife getting cancer and I'll sort this, and he has followed through on that. So when you get a chance to remind him that uh, it was remembered and we're proud of what he did, so thank you. I will, thank you. Um, any questions on animal welfare? Here we go. Um, I know uh, Jess Blair sits on the Sustainable Beef Board, and I know that that has been talked about at the table. I actually don't know what those conversations have been, um, but I know that they are working together on what that looks like. And look, um, like I said before, in, in any way that we can make um, incremental change or incremental improvements in animal welfare, we'll always look to do that. Um, and that could be across any kind of certification program. It doesn't necessarily have to be the SPCA one. Um, we would m be more than happy to engage in other programs and you know see if there's any changes that we would suggest um, and just work together to improve animal welfare. Any further questions on animal welfare? Yep, in the back of the room. We'll just get you to talk into the microphone. Yep. Hi, um, probably a question for Kelly and John. So New Zealand likes to see itself as a world leader in animal welfare. And, you know, we have been ranked highly before we slipped down the ranking in the last World Animal Protection Index. So my question is, are we still leaders? And if we're not, then what do we need to do to either improve or maintain our position as leaders? Do you want to start at your end? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was uh, I tried. that was an Irish hospital pass if I've ever seen one. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think part of it picks up on some of the conversations that we had here. That um, a, as a whole, animal welfare is uh, and its definition is changing. Um, also, the science around animal welfare and what we know and what we can do is also changing. So, for example, if we picked up on pain relief um, for disbudding, there's opportunities in both pre and post pain relief. So, looking at opportunities that are out there that are being utilised overseas and maybe not as picked up in New Zealand as yet, but it's coming. Um, those are opportunities where we can work together to make those changes. Another one you could look at is maybe um, trying to look at a win-win scenario in terms of shade and shelter. Like I know that we get um, uh, hammered quite a bit um, that our shade and shelter in some cases isn't uh, as high as it should be, but maybe there's opportunities in terms of planting shade and shelter, um, our waterways, fencing those off, and then um, carbon sequestration, you know, putting all of those together. We all win in that case, and I think that again would just bump us up. And we're, you know, I've spent a bit of time, um, I've worked in abattoirs in a couple of countries in Africa, and our animal welfare is, you know, it, I just, it's miles ahead. Um, you know, you can make big changes in those systems overseas because they are, the divide is so wide. Um, in New Zealand, it is about incremental change. In most cases, obviously, you know, you've got that bell curve and you can make big changes at the bottom. But sometimes, you know, there's a lot of people who are um, punching, you know, well above our weight and it's awesome to see. So it's just getting more of those out there and talking about it as well, telling our story. Uh, some wise person once said that when enough has been said, a fool has to add to it. So I'll be the fool. Agree with everything that Kelly has said. Um, I, I, th I think we are. We are world leading. But I, and again, I think it was Dana that said that you can be on the right road, but if you sit down, you're going to get run over by the next vehicle that, that comes uh, through. Um, we, we don't want to be also wrens. We've, we've got to... 
We've got a challenge in New Zealand in that there's no subsidization in the system, which means the scale of our businesses is far greater than the vast majority of the people that are putting their hand up to compete against us. And I think that's a challenge that we need to be aware of. I think the inclusion of sentience in our, in our act was an extremely important step to be seen to be recognizing that animals care about their situations, even if we can't describe it and define it well enough. Now, unfortunately, I mean, I sit in a lot of meetings with farmers, and, um, and I've, the vast majority of my friends are farmers, um, and, and so I get the constant discussion about, um, about sentience and a lack of willingness to accept it, and more importantly, a lack of willingness to accept that the market accepts it. And, and so I think that's where we really can improve. Our animal welfare is really, really good, but we shouldn't have a debate every time we think an animal has feelings and whether we can change our management strategy to, to better give better effect to those feelings. The one that sticks out in my mind the most was the debates we had over induction in the dairy industry. You know, wow, they were heated. If we thought mycoplasma was heated, they were heated. And, um, and yet, we got rid of it, we, we worked it out of the industry, and, and looking around now, it, you know, the lack of it doesn't really make a difference. Well answered, thank you very much. John, while you've got that microphone, I'm gonna move to you now, the next uh, topic of questions. What are the next government policies coming in? That's a ball and string, I realise, or crystal glass. The aims of those policies and what support will there be to our industry to meet those policies and regulations? Don't shoot the messenger, but I... Have it. <laughs> I'm from the government, I'm here to help. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, there's Where another one start? of those Irish policies. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let, let, me, let me take a tangent, be a typical politician here, and take a tangent before I answer the question. First, first and foremost, I regard myself as a farmer. So, uh, you know, you can go uh, either side of my papa, and it's farming all the way back. Um, dairy beef and sheep at home. My, my brother had a, had a, beef, a beef breeder herd, suckler herd, and, and I finished forward stores to put myself through, through university. I bought my first farm when I was 20 with the help of the bank manager. Thank you, Dana. I'll be, I'll be thankful to him or her for a long time to come as well. Um, or I'm still passing on my gratitude every year, shall we say, anyway. Um, <laughs> and and uh, was involved in, in some of the early conversions in Canterbury thought I had learned everything there was to learn about farming and went to the United States and set up a couple of farms over there. And so um, farm, farming in my blood genuinely. And so, uh, again, to go back to our, our Director General, we are really, really keen that any policies that impact on farm, A, are as pragmatic as they can be, and I, I know they'll be sniggering around that, but that, that's our aim, and B, that we can support farmers through that, those policy changes. So that's the key thing. What are, the, what are the policies that are coming down? Well, we, we talked about them this morning. Climate change, obviously, there's mo multiple uh, um, parts of the, the regulations on that from Hewaka Ekanoa and how are we going to be pricing emissions in the agricultural sector right through to our emissions reduction plan and our legislative requirements around those uh, dropping our, great, our uh, methane by 10% in the next eight years and by somewhere between 20 and 50% over the 20 years after that, and then, uh, of course, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide going to net zero. Uh, water, or, or uh, essential fresh water um, regulations are live and, and coming through, and will be over the next uh, two to three years, obviously with a regional council responsibility there, but under the national policy statement for that. There's obviously changes to the Resource Management Act that will touch on farming as well, so it's not just a built environment that will be impacted by that, but forestry. So we're currently consulting, debating, reconsulting on a, you know, permanent exotic forests. Um, are, they, are they feasible? Should they exist? Some of the community think they should. A lot of the community think they shouldn't. The perverse outcomes is if carbon gets high enough, beef and sheep properties become very valuable for growing wood rather than for growing meat. So these are all, uh, so these are live and happening. Um, that, that's probably the, the, the most important ones without delving into the minor ones. Um, what are we doing? Well, we don't hold the pen on a lot of those, as you can appreciate. We have a Ministry for the Environment, Department of Conservation, obviously also leading uh, in, in the biodiversity space and the protection of uh, valuable soils. I can't remember what the actual title of that is, but to put the two of those together are really, really important that we protect both our agricultural soils, you know, the, possibly some of the best soils in the world for growing vegetables are going under concrete um, half an hour's drive south of Auckland. Um, that, that shouldn't be happening and we need to uh, create the environment that, that protects, preserves those soils and yet 
establishes a framework mm -hmm. that everyone can have a house if they if they so desire. Mm -hmm. um, biodiversity again uh, being consulted on currently. Feedback has come through a lot of a lot of good feedback, and again I think the agency in charge of that will have to take account of that. In MPI, what are we doing about it? We're working reason reasonably closely with those other agencies, and you do have to appreciate that we, we do have our disagreements, interdepartmental disagreements. We've got um, different responsibilities under different acts, and, and, and so there's, there's going to be that level of very healthy tension between us as we try and work our way through to pragmatic solutions. Um, the other things, obviously, we're doing, not only uh, am I the chief science advisor at MPI, but as of yesterday morning, I am now the, the, the director of on-farm support services as well, because apparently I had a half an hour to spare on a Friday afternoon that wasn't being utilized properly. Um, uh, and so MPI is standing up a on-farm support service where we're not, it's not an advisory service. I don't want to scare the horses out there and that we're coming out as a government funded agent, um, advisory service to compete with the private sector out there. We're not, but we do believe that there is a gap in the service provision, provision to farmers in terms of translating regulations and providing the solutions to those regulations in real time. And so we will work with farmers, we will work with their, far their trusted advisors, we will work with the banks, we will work with whoever we can to ensure that farmers understand the regulations that are coming, what are their responsibilities, and how can they best meet them right across, particularly climate change and water quality, but also animal welfare, really, really important. And then finally, you know, we're, we are probably, I think I could say this, the biggest research and development funder into the primary sector through SFF Futures. Um, and that is often undersubs undersubscribed, and we are really, really keen to get grassroots ideas on how we can um, do research and development to make a far more sustainable primary sector. As good as we are, we want to get better. Final point, regenerative agriculture. So we, we took up the narrative on that, or I took up the narrative on that. Again, I think I was too slow as the hot potato was being passed around the table. I was probably on Twitter or something, and it landed in my lap. Um, and that was uh, three years ago. Uh, many of you will be involved in those discussions. I've never seen one word cause such angst among communities yeah. as the word regenerative. Um, and the amount of my peers in the science uh, community that really want to have a good go at me about this. Um, what I did was uh, pull together a technical advisory group of scientists, farmers, marketers, iwi Maori, to try and understand what does regenerative agriculture mean for New Zealand. Farmers were really clear. They did not want a standard. They did not want to be um, a certification scheme for regenerative agriculture because what you would end up with is organic agriculture, again, with an input-focused model rather than an outcome-focused model. So th they didn't want a definition on that basis. We came up with a vision, and I'm going to butcher the vision, but it's, it's available on our website, and that is basically that regenerative what we've called regenerating Aotearoa, um, but regenerative agriculture for New Zealand is uh, a, a acknowledgement that practices either alone or in concert will improve fresh water and marine environment, will improve biodiversity both in the soil and in the landscape, will um, improve animal welfare, has, uh, will, will improve profitability, and will leave a, a sustainable environment for future generations to come. Now, the reason why I'm butchering it is there's a lot of te reo thrown, thrown into the, that as well. So, um, look, I, I'm very proud of the, of the vision, as wordy as it is, and I really like the, the sharp, sharp, vi sharp visions that I see from commercial companies. But to try and capture the views of, of that collective of people as to what does it mean to them, and that is really what regenerating Aotearoa is. It is to the consumer, what does it mean to them? So, sorry, that's a real No, that's, that's good. Uh, the follow-up of that question is, who else is in the industry that can step in and, and specifically how can, and, you know, how can they help? We've got so many um, strings getting pulled at the moment from all the industry groups and the uh, and the uh, respect that some of the farmers have for the industry groups, and then groundswell and all this other pollution that's coming in, how do we maintain those lines of communication? Is this what you're doing on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock? <laughs> that's some of it. Uh, look, we, we're doing that on multiple trades, and I, uh, but I think you're right. Uh, I mean, one of, one of the beauties of, of the term, he waka ekanoa, is it is so explicit. We are all in this together. We're all in the same waka, and we, 
we have to paddle the same direction. Um, and so um, we, we meet regularly as a, as a senior leadership team at, at, at um, MPI with all of the major industry groups. We have a food and fiber partnership group, which is the CEs of the major, sorry, is the board chairs of the major industry groups. We have Naipoforo Tamatua, which is the, um, the Maori leaders from right across the, the primary sector. Both of those providing guidance to us on how we can better engage with the primary sector and provide a better service. And then right down through the channels, um, we, we are reaching out in, in different places. Um, we, we have no intention of, of being a, a government agency coming out to tell farmers uh, from the government, I'm here to help. Really, we want to be on the ground working with farmers to find the solutions that are pragmatic and are New Zealand focused. Um, you know, we, no, that number eight wire mentality in New Zealand, when you think about it, I live in, in Kirikiriro, I live in Hamilton, and within 10 kilometers to the north of me, Bill Gallagher's father uh, um, developed the electric fence, uh, Ron Sharp developed the herringbone shed. Uh, Dr. Pat Shannon at LIC, five kilometers to the east of me, developed sperm di diluent that allowed us to actually have the AI system that we have in New Zealand, which is unique to New Zealand. Um, Ruakura is only four kilometers to the south of me. We have had a hundred years of agricultural um, e um, evolution, I suppose, by scientists and farmers and government working together. The fourth cog to that wheel is Iwi Maori, and that's what we're trying to coalesce, bring that together, and work to find the solutions that we can. Okay, any questions for Dr. Rush? Ian? Thanks, mate. Dana touched on it earlier, the, the advantage that New Zealand finds itself in now because of some of the policies around climate. It seems from the outside that that may have been coincidental. It, it wasn't designed to help business, it was designed to help the environment by doing so. I wonder, is that a lens you pass over other policies being written? And policies often written to rule out the bad, are you also developing policy frameworks that help create the data that allows us to talk about products internationally that enable customers and consumers to buy in at the top end as well so that everyone gets to get supported by policy? Um, so I, it, it wasn't by accident. I, I can assure you that was very deliberate and, and that was just recognising the science. And in fact, one of the frustrations of the noise um, uh, that uh, out there in the industry is around whether we should use GWP versus GWP star, for example. To me, that's a marketing question. So, you know, those people marketing products in the marketplace can use GWP star. What we have done is we have set up an act that requires, we don't ha need GWP star. We have separated methane out to the side. We, we do not have to get to zero with methane. Uh, where we have to ultimately get up is still um, get to is it, there is still room um, for for debate on that whether it's 20 percent, 30 percent, or 40 percent. But um, and that debate is about to occur as well. And the long-lived gases need to go to zero. So that effectively takes the need for GWP star out of the equation. And I think we are certainly in other agriculturally dominate, dominated economies like the one my accent hails from. We are the envy of those because of that split gas approach in the act. Um, we don't have policies as such to uh, lift up that, that, that marketing platform, shall I say. But again, SFF Futures, we invest large swaths of money, up to $70 million a year through SFF Futures to uh, allow people to um, uh, develop the techniques and, and measure the outcome of those techniques so that they can be used in that. And that's, uh, we partner with companies uh, for on, a, on a marketing level, and we partner with farmers at the grassroots level uh, and everything in between. Um, and I had a, an even better idea in my head that is now, oh, there, th and that's, that's only through SFF Futures. There's a lot of other money going out of MPI, um, whether it's into catchment groups or whatever, to get measurements to show that what we're doing is actually having that positive impact in the environment, so that nature first that, that you talked about, Ian, yeah. All right, any further questions? Dr. John? Okay, very well answered. Um, is brain fade after the Irish win in rugby um, the same as COVID brain fade? <laughs>
It's not, I can assure you, because I, <laughs> I had COVID and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's been a battle over the last 10 weeks to try and, and get back to normality. Um, but yes, there's a couple of hours after that match that I have very limited memory of. <laughs> Thanks for your honesty. Okay, uh, let's move to you now, Susie, if we could. Um, looking at our retail sector. Can you name some sustainability elements that the retail sector is responding to and what consumers are looking for in, an, that's a, in the sustainable space? Yep. Um, I think I would refer to the earlier presentations today because I think um, that was kind of probably covered in a lot of detail by, by Ian and, and Dana. And, you know, I think a lot of what is driving um, sustainability trends now is not essentially only been driven by the, by the consumer. It's also um, been driven by that... Um, that respons responsible investment um, and this growing um, requirement, I guess, for for business to to be able to um, demonstrate how they're they're driving, um, you know, sustainable agriculture. Um, I think, um, yeah, it, it's really um, just if you can ask the question again specifically, I'll make sure I'll answer the question. Oh, that's fine. Um Name some of the sustainability elements in the retail sector and how you're, how you're responding to them and what are the consumers looking for in that sustainable space? So I, I think those um, sustainable elements are probably, um, I think, again, clearly aligning with a lot of the reporting requirements. So, um, you know, and then there's the obvious ones that are c quite consumer facing. So obviously there's a lot of um, consumer awareness of, of climate change. Um, there's a lot of consumer awareness around um, animal welfare. I think they're probably the, the, the two big ones. Um, you know, I think a lot of what's happening in the, in the world um, recently around, um, you know, social, um, social practices um, and social impacts as well as, um, you know, natural disasters and, and the way that the climate is changing and how that's impacting us all. Obviously, COVID recently is, is impacting us all. So that, I think that is driving, um, you know, probably at a, at a faster rate and awareness from the consumer perspective and, and making the consumers reevaluate their, their values. Is there a reason that McDonald's, for instance, aren't standing on their soapbox and screaming from the rooftops their uh, efforts in sustainability? Um, I think it, um, a lot of it is um, making sure that we're not green greenwashing. Um, it's really important. Um, we've seen a lot of, um, I guess, companies that are out there talking about what they're doing um, being criticised for, for greenwashing. Um, I, I think it's really that investment in, in driving true positive impact and, and, you know, making a real difference. Um, you, you, a lot of it is long-term transitional change and, you know, it, it does actually take a while to make sure that you're actually doing the right thing to, to, to um, get a true beneficial outcome. So, um, you know, from a McDonald's perspective and, again, probably links back again to um, my response to the question about, about brand trust, it, it's really making sure that, that what you're doing is actually driving the, the true positive change. Um, I think um, the reference earlier to the fact that you, you set goals and you, you demonstrate your intention to drive that true, um, you know, impact... And then, and then once you are actually getting that data to support that you're actually going in the right direction, I think that's when you can have permission to come out and, and talk about it. Anyone got any questions around retail before I... I think uh, probably just one other thing that I'd add as well, um, you know, what's driving probably some of the trends around um, around what supply chains is doing. It, it's also the, um, the that proposition around um, resilience. So I, I think, again, um, a lot of what drives um, what McDonald's is doing, apart from the fact that we want to be, um, you know, responsible in terms of um, growing our business, it's, it's all around also making sure that we can continue to, to serve the products that our, that our consumers want. So, um, you know, we're really um, blessed in New Zealand and Australia that we can source um, most of our products locally, um, you know, with the, with the large agricultural base. And 
um, you know, again, it, it's just as much in our interests um, and, you know, we, we have a, a supply chain ethic which is um, working really closely with our suppliers, you know, partnerships and, and it's around having, um, you know, that um, thriving sort of um, future for, for everyone, um, you know, including the, the producers of, of the food. And so really it's, it's also the... It's really also the driver that, you know, we want beef producers to continue to, to thrive and, and be able to continue to produce beef well into the future um, and that you're actually um, making changes that's going to improve your long-term resiliency to, to a lot of the, the changes that, that are happening. Could you pass... Thank you. Can you pass that to Anthony next year? Anthony, last time I drove through ARIA, it was a few years ago, there was no McDonald's store in ARIA. But how does it make you feel as a farmer when you see um, companies like McDonald's putting up a, a Grand Angus burger or, or, or looking at that local beef um, chain, you know, the process from your place to, to the consumer? How does that, does that give you a sense of pride and, and belief and does that make you want to be more involved in the industry? In the word, yes. Um, and I've followed, I've followed um, beef through the system right through the, um, the burger making facility in Waitra and into the back of McDonald's to make my own burger as well. I question whether I was eating my own beef, but I'm sure there's a bit in there somewhere. Um, yeah, it does make me proud, and I like to see it. You know, that Angus burger was was great to see, and the, the way McDonald's puts its hand up to some respect to support guys like myself is good. It's, I wish more to do it, really. To get more to do it, we need more farmers to do what we're doing here today. How are we going to lead them to this table? Yeah, you're going to have to stop their farms being planted in trees as a bugbear of mine around our area, especially, which I believe is chopping down our supply of beef because it's killing the ground that our beef cows are grazing on. But yeah, you, you need more guys here, you're right, and to be su supplying into this market and getting... One of the things I find out there is getting guys that are going to get themselves into a position that they get audited to meet these sorts of things which are in place to get their meat through a, a process and into a works which does supply somewhere like McDonald's. I'm not sure of the stats around it, but we're not all audited. And I think we got covered this morning, actually. We're going to have to be, and it got covered yesterday over the road at the beef conference that it's coming. Mm. And there's going to be, to touch on your, Dana, your one, there will be a drop off the end. So there's a couple of things going on in the background for me. One is the price of land, because as more and more land disappears, and I've, I can see it from the top of the hills at my place, if it goes into trees, I can't see it coming back out, whether it gets trees for carbon or trees for wood, or either way. We need more land like that, and we need more guys that have got that land to meet the requirements to continue supplying. Because I don't know at what point supply becomes a problem for beef, but you wouldn't want too many guys to start more disappearing into trees, cows, and, and whatever else, concrete. Okay, thank you. Susie, can I get you to grab the microphone again, please? What is your biggest challenge at the moment in, in your industry when it comes to putting beef out there? I think, um, you know, again, it's it's just really um, continuing to maintain the, the consumer trust in beef. You know, McDonald's is built on, you know, it's built on a hamburger. Um, you know, beef is synony synonymous to, uh, to our business. Um, you know, we're we, we seeing this kind of um, confrontation around, um, you know, those, those challenges to beef. So I think the challenge for us is to to be able to collectively bring stakeholders together in in the beef industry to, to make sure that you um, you know tell the good stories about you know about about beef and um, I, I think find the balance in terms of um, you know how you do address some of the issues um, that you know that can be improved around beef production. Um, and then I think it's just, um, yeah, it's probably really from a when you when you ask me about the challenge to continue to serve beef, um, my my supply chain brain just jumps to, um, you know, how we continue to offer value to the 
consumers, like the price of beef is, is increasing. Um, again, how do you make sure um, that all of these other things that we need to do to help maintain consumer trust in beef doesn't further escalate the, the cost of beef so that it makes it um, not, not affordable to, to offer in our, in our restaurants. Um, you know, our restaurants are around a value offering to consumer. We're not, um, you know, the, um, we're not a five-star restaurant that can, then c that can charge, you know, $100 for, for a steak. So that, that often also um, creates a, a challenge for us. Cool. I'd like to pass it over to Matt, please. Matt, you are um, basically the fulcrum, the pivot. Your industry, the processing industry, is the fulcrum in all of this. The restrictions around processing, the um, securing the, the market share of supply, uh, the guarantee of sustainability, and, and all of the things that we're talking about here today pretty much lands fair and square on your shoulders as that fulcrum between producer and supplier and consumer. Tell us a little bit about that equation. How does that stack up with you? Or am I loading it up too much? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, um, obviously we do have a responsibility. The processes, uh, there's a few of us in the room all doing a relatively good job in the market telling our farmer's story. Um, with regards to sustainability, <coughs> obviously we've been uh, out there in the market telling a story to a set of consumers that are looking for that. Um, so yes, there's a consumer set, but we as processors also realise the danger of New Zealand's biggest weed, uh, which is the pine forest. Um, so we see it from both directions. We've got processing capacity that is getting lost to that pine forest and carbon forestry, uh, but then also see that opportunity in the market where we can drag and create a carrot by getting in front of consumers and telling our good news story. So it's, it's both sides of that story and often it's uh, a complicated story to tell because often we're kind of leading that bleeding edge in that environmental space. Um, so environments like this, so the round table, enables that collaboration and actually a wider voice so that we can go back to the government uh, industries and, and departments and actually tell the story that the industry is moving in the direction that we need to and so therefore the stick won't come out from the government as badly as it would have if we sat in our hands and did nothing. Is that answering yeah, your question? Yeah, definitely. What are your... I mean, COVID's been a real nightmare for the processing industry. Staff is still an, an issue, and immigrant staff is starting, will hopefully come right in the future. How do you fix that? How do, how do you, um, you must have to have a plan around that. Yeah, can I hand this to another processor in the room? <laughs> <laughs> um, My job no, was no, to challenge yeah, here yeah, today. No, fair, fair enough, fair enough. Um, no, and uh, yes, the processors are having a tough time, but honestly, it's the farmers that feel it in the neck. So uh, obviously a huge thank you to the farmers in the room that have struggled through over the last few years, um, and, and uh, we haven't probably done the job that we should have um, for various reasons, supply chain issues, warehouse space, staffing, the list literally goes on. Um, the plan out of it uh, is a difficult one and, and the major concern obviously we have at the moment is staffing like everyone else. So um, we are constantly lobbying the government to allow more in um, and obviously hopefully that'll solve part of the issue. Um, but at the same time, obviously, I know that uh, Alliance, for example, invested a heap of money into automatic warehousing down at the Lawnville plant. Those kind of things that our processes are doing to try and solve that problem is, um, is one way or one of the solutions. There's no magic bullet, is there? Okay, anyone got any questions? I'm done. I'm going to come back to you and wrap up with finance, well, a little bit, and then I'll do mental health and wellbeing. But, um, yeah, Rory. Okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, the danger of opening a can of worms for John on um, regenerative agriculture. I was just wondering, I mean, the biggest weed is the pine forest, right? 
And it sounded to me like the, your definition of regenerative would be the, the sort of counterbalance to that. If you can do all the things you say you can do as regenerative, why do you need any pine forest? So I'd just like to hear from everybody, is there a way of actually measuring those regenerative outputs? I know that McDonald's has funded research on this, so I'm just interested on some opinions there. Uh, how to counter that argument that we need pine forests at all? Yeah, look, it's a great question, Rory. Um, so the second half of it, there is a lot of research going into quantifying the benefit because that's to, to avoid the, the greenwashing, which has gone up there on the, on the wall. Um, and uh, I can probably say it, even though we haven't announced it yet, uh, we, we will be releasing our portfolio of, of what we're investing in in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we're investing uh, with partners uh, probably in excess of $30 million um, uh, over long-term research projects to try and measure what is happening in soil carbon, what is happening with pollinators in terms of biodiversity, um, and that's across the dairy, beef, sheep, um, horticulture, mm -hmm. uh, and, vi and viticulture space. So we are investing very heavily in uh, testing practices to see what the outcome is. So people have an opinion that if I do this, I'll end up with that. Without evidence, we obviously can't take that to the market, so we're, we're investing heavily in that. Um, look, uh, obviously, um, I, I'm a carnivore. I, I eat red meat and I drink milk. I mean, it's as simple as that. If, if I had put all the money uh, that I gave to McDonald's over the last 30 years into shares in McDonald's, I'd be retired right now. But um, so, I'm, um, uh, so I'm very, very passionate about uh, beef and sheep and, and dairy farming. Uh, no matter what way we look at it, we are going to need more timber. Uh, we will not be able to dry milk with coal. We will not be able to um, run our processing facilities with coal. And so we will need more timber. The most important thing is that we put the right timber in the right place and we don't erode the capacity of people like Richard to, to actually produce the highest standard of red meat in, in the world. I still believe that. Certainly the most tasty. Um, and so... I don't think regenerative will undermine that, but what regenerative will do is, it, or sorry, what we're doing in regenerative is it will provide an evidence base for us to take our products to market and show that, look, our soil carbon is 30% higher than the average of the world. It's 50% higher than the United States. It's 200% higher than, than Australia. And so, you know, we're at that point already because of all of the work that our farmers and, and their colleagues have done over the last several hundred years. So... Um, we got an extraordinary opportunity. I think in terms of, of protecting um, our, our good agricultural land from pine forest, that is the debate that is currently happening around the RMA. So uh, the idea of planting pine as permanent forest has really uh, created angst for good reason, and the government has listened, and there's been consultation that's ongoing in that. Um, so I don't think you're uh, sorry. I don't think you're opening a can of worms. I do. I, I would just like to leave with, with a, a kind of a summary for me. I was I was trained as a nutritionist, and I know you wouldn't think that to look at me, but um, I was trained as a nutritionist. But the best piece of, of dietary advice I was ever given was stick to the outside aisle of the supermarket, avoid the inside aisles, stick to the outside aisle. And when you look at the New Zealand agricultural system, we produce the outside aisle of the supermarket. So look, thinking of my own uh, local supermarkets, you know, you walk in fresh fruit and veggies, down to the red meat aisle, around the corner to the ice creams and, and, the, and the milk and the cheese, etc., and, and down past the bread and into the alcohol corner at the end. And we produce it all. <laughs> and it's a perfectly balanced diet. That is, a badge, that, that is a badge of honor that we should be wearing with pride and, and shouting about it, absolutely. But just remember, if we sit down in the road, the, the, you know, the, the road train that's coming behind us will run straight over the top of us. So I think, um, you know, what was discussed pre-morning tea was, was illuminating, and I really appreciate the speakers for giving their insights. Okay. If anyone wants to add. Did that answer your question, Rory? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Anybody else? Chris Allen, I got told that you might have a question or two now that you're uh, retired from Federated Farmers and the, and the foot is off your throat. <laughs> 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 What is the most important aspect of what we see up here that we need to worry about? Or do we need to worry about them all and we're not branding it that we are talking about all the issues? Because is it water? Is it climate? Is it people? We've got these all in little boxes, but we focus on one box at a time rather than the whole story. Uh, I actually think it might not be up there. 
But I, I think I it's think collaboration it is, is the word that should be up there that ties all of those things together. And it's collaboration that's going to be able to solve a lot of those things. Um, so not answering your question, I know, but it's everything but through collaboration. Um, I might take a liberty here as the welfare spokesman today. Oh, I think it's actually not up there yet, and it is human welfare, whether it be um, food that they eat or the strength to be resilient and change or pro um, have the ability to assess what's required to stay within regula regulations. But um, some of the things that are coming into my space as a, as a um, mental health uh, facilitator is that we're all here today talking about the, the positives and what we need to do and the changes. But when Joe Farmer, um, who this lovely lady's husband or partner, uh, husband to be, is the stock agent, starts talking about the EU free trade agreement and how they wouldn't let us in with that very small trade agreement. And they go, what is the point of all of this change and all of this work that we're doing if the world market politically won't let us in? The fallout around that for Joe Farmer in the last month in my space has been huge. Does anyone have any comment on that from our panel? I'll just give a really quick one on that, actually. Um, I think, and John, it was really great to hear about what NPI are doing in terms of um, helping to break down how we talk about policy and things like that with farmers. If I put my agri-banker hat on, there is certainly, um, and it'll be the same for stock agents and so forth, there's so much there, and the other trusted advisors that are going on farm and need to have these conversations and you have one interaction with someone who might have their head buried in the sand and gets quite you know, emotional or quite um, defensive about it, and it really knocks the confidence of whoever that was that went out on farm to have that conversation. So I think that's great to hear because that's probably a really big challenge that we've got is actually how do we support um, like the real service providers, the stock agents, those that are going out on farm and being asked to be enablers of the conversation. Um, how do we support them to give them the confidence so that they have techniques and tactics to um, accurately answer the, answer the questions and deal with um, what often becomes a really political conversation and angle it to be a really productive, proactive conversation. So I think that's probably um, a really big challenge for the sector is actually just like how do you empower those that are being asked to go on farm and have those conversations? Look, just to add to that, uh, and I agree with everything that Dana has said, and it, it is about empowering those people to have those conversations. Um, look, Adam Smith in, in, in Wealth of Nations, um, you know, whatever it was, 250 years ago, argued very simplistically around economics that, you know, the, the invisible hand of the economy will run perfectly as people, if, if people act in their own self-interest and behave rationally. Um, well, I mean, the only thing we can say about people is that they don't act in their own self-interest and they are Im unpredictably irrational. Um, you know, drinkers, smokers, um, et cetera, obvious examples of that. Um, I, I, Dana, Dana had a, a, a line or a word up on one of her slides, and that was access. Uh, we have access because of everything that our producers are doing. Uh, increased access would be brilliant, but we've actually got that access and we could lose that access by not being as good as we are. And I think that's the thing to remember. Obviously, I have um, bi-weekly or tri-weekly conversations with people that have a very different opinion as to whether New Zealand dairy and red meat should be left into the EU. And um, I still remember the fallout of the Mercosur deal where they allowed Brazilian red meat into Europe. Um, and so their politicians are obviously dealing with their mental health challenges over there as well, having created a a social science experiment, if you will, a, a social engineering experiment in the late 1970s, early 1980s that, that created a, a, rural, um, a, a rural structure that's just not commercially viable. And n the, Protectionism, the I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, pain, the pain that's associated with removing that now would be 
untenable. It, it just couldn't happen, uh, especially considering they are such a small part of the entire EU population. It, it serves political interests and it serves their, their food security interests to make sure that those farmers remain and remain, remain happy. So I wasn't surprised that we, we failed to get additional uh, more than what we got. I think we got a very good deal in the UK, um, which again was 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 refreshing, and I think um, you know those negotiators and 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 certainly the people that are in front of the cameras um, at the end are are important people in those trade negotiations. But again, there's a huge amount of ordinary uh, Joes and 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 Sheilas that are that are actually sitting around tables at night or on Zoom at night negotiating out those deals. I think we've we've had a lot of success this year, and I think we should acknowledge that. Um, I think uh, farmers are dealing with it tough, and as I said, virtually all of my friends are farmers, so we talk about this a lot, and I hear about it a lot. Um, one of the things I, I, I think is that New Zealand farmers, in the space of five to ten years, are going through what European farmers went through in 40 years. And that's, yeah. that's, part, of, that's that. part of the hard part of this journey, is that it's all happening, and it's all happening at once. Uh, so to the question that was asked earlier, you know, what, what is the most important thing up there? Um, I think they all are important. I agree with you completely. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. Yeah. The people that are producing the food need to uh, be told how important they are. Not to the economy, that's important, that's obvious, you can throw out a number. But how important they are, they're the bedrock of rural New Zealand, they're the, the backbone of their, of their uh, communities. Um, and I still go back, uh, many of you will have seen it, the Dodge Ram ad that was on the Super Bowl, uh, whatever it was, five or six years ago. And on the eighth day, God looked down over all that he had created and decided that he needed a caretaker. So God created a farmer. Yeah. And, and went on from there. If you haven't read the poem, read the poem. It's a tearjerker as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I'm, I'm a bit of a softie. Um, that's why I work in government. Um, <laughs> So, uh, uh, look, I think um, we, we, we all collectively need to tell farmers how important they are. We also need to give them hope. We have dealt with every challenge that has been thrown at us by nature in the last 12,000 years, whether it was political or natural, we will overcome these. And we are, I mean, you, you, you heard that the government is investing $340 million over the next four years to knock methane on the head. We have never had a better opportunity knock me thin on the head. So let's get behind it. Uh, yeah, down the way. Yeah, um, Dave, there should be a microphone coming your way. Yeah, hi, it's probably a question for the room as much as the panel. Um, we've been involved in the uh, implementation of uh, farm plans and farm system change for the last 10 or 11 years and it's, it's been it's been fun because it's we've dealt with the full demographic um, and this is what happens when you, when regulation can be involved the what, what and and what my job's become very much one of social behavior change um, I'm an ex farmer um, but, and and one of the words that we're missing I think well the question for the room is how is the implementation? What is the framework? You know, when I was working with ANSCO a number of years ago, the, um, the stock agents were a very important part of the communication of what's going on. They were the brokers. Um, going forward, how do we get the full, you know, what are the constraints? Why isn't everyone signed up at the moment to, to, to the sustainable beef? Um, what do we need to do to, to get this in action? Okay, maybe I'll come back to that, as we said there. Hitangata, hitangata, hitangata. So it comes down to the people. The people that... Um, I do a lot of work, it's called AgriConnect and whatever with Waggy, lean on a gate, talk to a mate of the two campaigns that I've done. As that mental health thing, what I'm seeing from the farmers is that some of the only contacts that they ever see, especially during the COVID times when the front gate was shut, are your people, the people that the processors send out, the people that the MPI send out, the bank managers, occasionally the SBCA, um, and definitely the front person at McDonald's, um, or the, the advertising around their products, such as the Angus Burger. And I'm hoping my farmer friend over there will be able to back me up on that. 
those people are the people that I'm running around the country trying to educate as to how to have those discussions on mental health, but also to know what to do with the knowledge that they get back from those farmers to take back to their managers and, and, and use that in that space and, and feed the chain both ways. So give them options once they've had that uh, conversation. If they run across a farmer with poor animal welfare or uh, fighting with the bank or they're having trouble and their kids are bringing this to school, et cetera, et cetera. There's all these underlying issues. And when you talk about the speed of it, I totally agree with that. I've got farmers in Mid Canterbury that still drive their TEA tractor out that they got when they were 14 years of age from their grandfather to drive the auger to, to put the grain in the silo. As well as that, they've got their brand new computer spray system that they can hardly work. So the, the, the speed of all this change is has been epitulated on them in a very, very short time. And their brains aren't registering like that. The f they can count sheep five deep through a gate. That's easy. But all of this is coming at them at 100 mile an hour. And we talk about the changes in banks, and on a number of times I hear the bloody banks wanting me to go down the um, sustainable path. You know, when did this become a thing? And I'm a board of trustees chair at a local school and um, I've got farmers on that board with me, and all of a sudden we've got to do a carbon footprint of our school. So it's coming at all angles. So what needs to happen in the mental health space, I think, is that your people need to make sure that what we talk about here, that wraparound support, that we are all in this, and, and that groups like this can really lead them to a good pathway, and this is the reason why. The best example of what's happened in the EU market that I can take back to those farmers that are worried about that free trade agreement is exactly what you've just said, John. And that should be what gets relayed back through to those farmers who feel aggrieved that they've done all this riparian planting, et cetera, et cetera, and it hasn't worked. And I see Dana nodding her head there because she's at the front of this as well. So when it comes to um, mental health and wellbeing, I think it's a two-way street. Some of the only people that farmers get to see because they've turned their TVs off and, they've, and that is, and this came through the meetings that I ran every Thursday night called Whatever with Wiggy, um, Zoom meetings, and we had Damien O'Connor in and we, we also had Close Woodbrook and we had a forum of farmers. Everything that came out of that was they're feeling under, overwhelmed and under-supported. And that Can is... Can I just reiterate on that a bit? That yeah. overwhelming thing, I reckon, is massive. Yeah. Change is scary. Yeah, it's here now, no. You can see it all around. They've been doing the same thing for so long, or maybe not so long, but they know it works, they know they are doing they're heading down the right path in their own mind. And when you get change coming at you this quickly, your lean on the gate comment is exactly what you need. But they don't because they're up a no exit road that's ten Ks long and it's metal and they own both sides of the road right to the end. And farmers are intergenerational when it comes to um, comes to the way they're bred. This farmer married the next door neighbour's daughter, and it's carried on. And they've bred farmer after farmer after farmer. Chris Allen's a, a classic example of it. <laughs> <laughs> and they tend to think in the red brain. There's been a lot of this um, study done on this in mental health. There's uh, there's been a lot of work done that farmers are always thinking in the red brain. They're very reactive. They are possessive and over-possessive about their, their farm. They'd rather see their kid... Um, they'd rather, if you take a paddock off them, you might as well take their firstborn off them. So they are really, really reactive, and a lot of times they see things coming out of media and coming... The first reaction when the bank starts talking about sustainability is, oh, not damn that. You know, that's their thought pattern. And it's a matter of giving them time to and knowledge to step back into that blue brain and slow down, take two steps back and then walk into that and lean into that. John, you saying? Just to add to that, like, uh, I, I think Richard's absolutely right. Someone once said, you know, the only person that likes change is a wet baby. And it's absolutely true. Change is scary. Nobody likes it. And so it is a case of, of, of breaking it down and showing that there's a way through it mm. without, without massive upheaval. But I just want to take you up on one of your earlier points. One of the reasons for us setting up this on-farm support service is to get that two-way dialogue. Um, you know, as the ministry, we own forests. We have foresters. We have processing facilities. We have guys on boats. We own boats. We have fisheries observers, etc. We're getting feedback from all the primary sector. Um, but we have a, a huge part of our remit is the Ministry of Agriculture. 
and we don't have anywhere near the same level of, since the days that the MAF advisors were privatized and moved into the industry bodies, we haven't had anywhere near the same level of feedback direct through an open door into Wellington. So one of the things we're trying to create through this on-farm support service is that feedback. We are the front door of Wellington. We can reach MFE, we can reach MFAT, uh, MSD, wherever, uh, but we want to have that service out there that will allow us to get that feedback back. So once again, we go back to the people. Um, and one of the things that came out of M. Bovis around mental health was how can we deal with MPI when they don't talk our language? Because, and your advisors, there's already been a lot of press around this advisory group, um, what people are going to be out there conveying this message. And typically, a young lady from Taranaki farming background is the people that we need to have in the front of this. And, and that's what we're looking for. Cool. That's good. Because that's that trust element. As we go through the AgriConnect thing, um, quite regularly, um, let's take a stock agent, for example, um, Young Meadow, uh, who I deal with, for example. I give him the right to spend $100,000 of my money buying stock in less than two and a half minutes. That, and he comes in and has a cup of coffee with my kids and reads them a book. He's the person that I trust, and that's where the investment needs to be. I think to get this message, this very, very good message, out into the into the people. If I just look around this room, I've just had a, a bit of a quick look around this room, and it's amazing um, with all the things that you run into, um, the people that you run into, and this is such an amazing group of people. I've weighed cattle for someone on this table. I've had representation and at whatever with Wiggy meetings there, a young farmer of the year contestant over there a farm inspector over there, a friend that I work with and trust dearly over there, another friend there, and the future wife of my stock agent. Everybody that has, there's such a big representation of this room, plus industry leaders and Global Roundtable. We've all come together in this group, how we get this out into the public and get that support level to a further level, but that, that realisation for farmers there are really good benefits in being on here. Um, I might just jump in and I think I've been reflecting as this discussion's been kind of unfolding and, um, you know, Matt, when you were asked the question, what, you know, what's the one important thing that comes up there? Again, let's come back to collaboration because, again, when you're talking about the, um, the human welfare aspect and being overwhelmed, you know, I think um, if we all work together, like that's the way that you you can make it an efficient process and, and um, understand the different tensions and the different perspectives, um, you know, how, how can you support, um, you know, that, that on the ground change and in the most efficient way um, that obviously, um, you know, doesn't add complexity, um, you know, it, it can help um, support producers. And I think um, we, have a, we have a mantra we, within McDonald's that, um, you know, none of us is good as all of us. And, you know, I think the more that we can all work together collaboratively, um, every, every person has um, different things that they resonate with. So, you know, for... Um, for one person, it, it might be getting a, a better interest rate or, or you know, getting um, addressing their debt. For another person, it might be um, the most important thing to them is, you know, animal welfare. Or, um, you know, for another person, it might be, um, you know, they, they have a total... Every person has a totally different driver. So, again, if we're all working together and we're all aligned, um, you can, you know, you can appeal to the, to the masses... Um, through through those different perspectives. Thank you, Dana. Uh, can we have the microphone over to Dana, please? Forgive me, it's Dana, Dana, Dana. It's Dana. Yep, I'm all like okay. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> um, right, so everyone talks about measuring results and practices. You're at the forefront of that. Everybody gets a financial report, quarterly, yearly, half yearly. What is... What is your belief in, in this system here or this, this round table to get farmers to feel supported and to have that good mental health, that good yearly report? Because you're the one that's seeing the farmers that are maybe pushing back a little in all of the aspects we talk about today and you're probably also seeing the farmers 
that are adopting this and moving forward? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there's, there's so many ways that you can answer that, right? Like, we could get into a whole discussion around integrated reporting and things like that, um, but I won't. I would just probably say that uh, th this room has been one of the uh, most enjoyable rooms that I've been in to talk to in a really long time. And it's about, I think, that everyone sat down here and you could just tell instantly that there was this like permission to be positive and this permission to be like really optimistic about the future and things like that. And I think one thing I've been thinking about a lot, and someone will have a much more um, educated idea on this than I do, but is I think in the sector we can sometimes fall into a little bit of a trap of it's actually easier to see all of the gripes that you could take with all of this change that's coming, because you're exactly right. Like we, we, um, we, no one likes change. There's a lot of uncertainty right now. And actually to be the people that sit down at those tables and try to help farmers see the positives and all of this, that is incredibly challenging. And so it's, I, I guess it just keeps coming back to for me about how we collaborate and how we uh, give each other permission to be positive when we sit down at those tables and just kind of boil it down to, let's just talk about your farm, let's talk about your farming business, what are you doing next, and just break down all of those uncertainties into like really basic fundamentals. Um, I don't know if that's fully answered yep. your question, Wiggy, but... Yeah, it is. Very good. Okay, I'm going to throw the floor open now to the, to the panel. Um, anybody got any questions for them? because Richard's busting a gut to do his AGM. Ian out the back, thank you. I've got, uh, it's a question that the Australian Dairy Sustainability Framework struggled with, and that is, who is the audience for this as a roundtable? Is it producers, or are producers better off not being confused by the tens of indicators that we're trying to chase, and they're better off just listening to their advisors, and then we're better off training the advisors? Is it consumers? So, I'd be interested to know, without making it seem like there's a discussion happening separate to farmers or separate to consumers, that, that they do have representative or representation in the group, how do we make this so it's not overwhelming for the farmers, but they also trust and understand? C could I just add to that, that um, I have the same question for the panel, if that's okay, but that's something that we struggle with as well, is we, we see so much coming down the pipeline and it's how much of that do you actually want to, um, it's not about being secretive with farmers, it's about like how much do you want to overwhelm them with the stuff. And so it, there is always that push-pull of when's the right time to say banks are going to have to report on TCFD so we're going to need this information too or whatever it is. So I, I guess I would ask the same question of the panel. Um, so with regards to the audience, I actually think it's both ends. Mm. Uh, so the voice that's created by the full supply chain enables conversations with the likes of government, uh, but also gives us permission to be screaming from the sh rooftops in the, in the market as well. Um, but so there's different parts of our sector that has representation. So you've got the beef and lambs of the world that sit for the farmers, you've got MIA that kind of sits over the processes and different parts of that supply chain have governing bodies. There's no one really taking care of that full supply chain and having that voice through to the governments of the world, um, well, government in New Zealand in this case, uh, that is enabled by the New Zealand Roundtable. So that's kind of my view of what we are about. Yeah, look, again, I go back to that, um, that Tereo phrase, he waka I, I think we're, we're, we are all in this together. So each, each um, node in that chain is a, a customer that needs to, be con needs to be convinced and needs to trust the person that's trying to convince them. Um, so we, we need, as, as Ian and, and Rory, you, you eloquently talked about, the need to be able to provide good scientific, robust evidence to the consumer for if they want to have make sustainable choices, that red meat is a part of that sustainable choice. Um, likewise, the, the farmer needs to understand that because they're a couple of steps removed from that person by and large. And let's face it, the, the free press don't represent 
that customer very well in terms of, of how they articulate the story around red meat. Um, I think, as I, as I started off this conversation, our philosophy, certainly within the Ministry for Primary Industries, is we want to work together with people to achieve the outcomes we all want to achieve. We've got a regulatory stick if it needs to be used, if we have to use it, but it is, we would like to be the regulator of last resort, if I was to put it in those terms. Um, there will be farmers that won't come along on the journey, and, and therefore there will have to be regulations to, to tidy up that. But uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I, or maybe, maybe they can be tidied up by the processor, because the processor is looking forward to the next link in the node to the consumer going, um, if I'm thinking from a Fonterra perspective, Danone or Nestle are going to want to know that the carbon footprint of the milk that's going into the, the powder or the cheese or whatever that's going into their products is the lowest carbon footprint that they can obtain. Um, Fonterra will need to ensure that their suppliers are providing that to them. Uh, they'll be looking to us as well, obviously, to ensure that the regulations support them in, in doing that as well. So, sorry, it, it's, um, I, I think it's all of us together, and that's why... Uh, to Dana's point, and sorry, Dana, I've been mispronouncing your name for the last hour and a half. Um, uh, you know, th this this conversation has been fantastic and uplifting. Yeah, you go next, actually. We, we'll wrap the panel now, so um, if you want to just tell us what you think of today as that farmer. Yeah, it's been quite an eye-opening for myself. Um, my take on your question is that a, a rising tide lifts all ships. So from one end of the spectrum right through from me to her, it's going to filter through all the way down from my perspective. That's an uneducated perspective to some degree. But yeah, no, I, th I think today's yeah, enlightening really for me. Thanks. Susie? Um, yeah, I think, I, again, it, I just think that message of collaboration, um, you know, there are so many different... Um, aspects of the of the value proposition and and you need to kind of you know address them all Donna. okay cool um i i would i'd have to reiterate what um the rest of the panel has said and in terms of the round table i think it's an opportunity everyone does have a different perspective perspective and a different driver that sits at that table but the opportunity is that two-way feedback so for example from an SPCA perspective having someone at the round table you can actually hear what's happening all the way across the supply chain you can take that on board and actually feed it up the line further and vice versa so if we know different things are coming or different challenges or or we see what we believe are challenges within the various industries, we can feed that back. So I just think it's really important to have that two-way feedback, but it goes further than that. Then it goes further down the line and up the chain. So um, from my perspective, it's been really interesting, um, quite eye-opening, and um, yeah, I'm interested to uh, see where it goes and be involved. Thanks. Oh, I think I um, sort of... Uh, wrapped it up before, but yeah, I mean, probably to these the same points. Uh, this is a great forum. Well done, everyone, for being in the room. Um, and yeah, really interested to kind of see what comes of this conversation. So thanks. Um, and just going back to your question, I actually see the round table as the fulcrum between both levels. The consumer needs that confidence and that be able to gain that knowledge of what they're reading and have that mental health aspect going back to that, that what they're putting in their children's mouths or their own mouths has that sense of quality and sustainability and they want to know that from there so that that's a trusted model that they're getting their knowledge from. For the farmer and the producer, they, the, the ones that really want to know will search deep, but the ones that just want to get on with their life and the ones that I'm dealing with, with the problems at the moment, the older generation, the 55 to 65, looking at succession planning and, and what are we leaving for our kids and stuff like that, and are we going to put this big burden around their neck? They want that security and knowledge that they've got. We've got people in the room that can answer those questions up there in a manner that is translated from Joe Farmer speak. And, and, and then the knowledge that they get back from those people uh, that are dealing with them on a day-to-day -day basis have the understanding and can translate all of this back into them and give them security and, and that presence of mind to continue to produce a good quality product that is able to be taken and transferred to those people there. 
So with that, I think uh, if anybody's got anything else, I'm going to hand it back over to uh, Richard just for your AGM. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, amazing. Yeah, Brown, you've done it. You've done amazing. Yeah, and that's um, I mean that's just got to be out there as much as it can possibly be. Well done. Give her a hand, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, Richard just suggested we have a five-minute toilet break or cup of coffee, whatever you like, and uh, we'll be back here at uh, 25 past, and we'll get into the AGM and, and bits and pieces. Thank you.